Chapter 1. My First Interview with the Alien Matilda O'Donnell McElroy Personal Note By the time the alien had been returned to the base, I had already spent several hours with her. As I mentioned, Mr. Cavett told me to stay with the alien since I was the only person among us who could understand her communication. I could not understand my ability to communicate with the being. I had never before that time experienced telepathic communication with anyone. The non-verbal communication I experienced was like the understanding you might have when a child or dog is trying to get you to understand something, but much, much more direct and powerful. Even though there were no words spoken or signs made, the intention of the thoughts were unmistakable to me. I realized later that although I received the thought, I did not necessarily interpret its meaning exactly. I think that the alien being was not willing to discuss technical matters due to the nature of her position as an officer and pilot with the duty to maintain the security and confidentiality required by her own unit or organization. Any soldier who is captured by the enemy in the line of duty has a responsibility to withhold vital information, even in the face of interrogation or torture, of course. But in spite of that, I have always felt that the alien being was not really trying to hide anything from me. I just never got that feeling. Her communication always seemed honest and sincere to me, but I suppose you can never know for sure. I definitely feel that I shared a unique bond with the alien. It was a kind of trust or empathy that you have with a patient or a child. I think it was because the alien could understand that I was really interested in her and had no harmful intention. Nor would I allow any harm to come to her if I could prevent it. This was true, too. I referred to the alien as her. Actually, the being was not sexual in any way, either physiologically or psychologically. She did have a rather strong feminine presence and demeanor. However, in terms of psychology, the being was asexual and had no internal or external reproductive organs. Her body was more like the body of a doll or robot. There were no internal organs as the body was not constructed of biological cells. It did have a kind of circuit system or electrical nervous system that ran throughout the body, but I could not understand how it worked. In stature and appearance, the body was quite short and petite, about 40 inches tall. The head was disproportionately large relative to arms, legs, and torso, which were thin. There were three fingers on each of two hands and feet, which were somewhat prehensile. The head had no operational nose or mouth or ears. I understand that a space officer does not need these, as space has no atmosphere to conduct sound. Therefore, sound-related sensory organs are not built into the body, nor does the body need to consume food, hence the absence of a mouth. The eyes were quite large. I was never able to determine the exact degree of visual acuity of which the eyes were capable, but I observed that her sense of sight must have been extremely acute. I think the lens of the eyes, which were very dark and opaque, may have also been able to detect waves or particles beyond the visual spectrum of light. I suspect that this may have included the full range of the electromagnetic spectrum or more, but I don't know this for sure. When the being looked at me, her gaze seemed to penetrate right through me, as though she had x-ray vision. I found this a little embarrassing at first, until I realized she had no sexual intentions. In fact, I don't even think she ever even had the thought that I was male or female. It became very obvious after a short time with the being that her body did not require oxygen, food, or water, or any other external source of nutrition or energy. As I learned later, this being supplied her own energy, which animated and operated the body. It seemed a little bit eerie at first, but I got used to the idea. It's really a very simple body. There's not much to it compared to our own bodies. Errol explained to me that it was not mechanical, like a robot, nor was it biological. It is animated directly by her as a spiritual being. Technically, from a medical standpoint, I would not say that Errol's body could not be called alive. Her dull body is not a biological life form with cells and so forth. It had a smooth skin or covering which was gray in color. The body was highly tolerant to changes in temperature, atmospheric conditions, and pressure. The limbs were quite frail without musculature. In space there is no gravity, so very little muscle strength is needed. The body was used almost entirely on a spacecraft or in low or no gravity environments. Since Earth has a heavy gravity, the body was not able to walk around very well, as the legs were not really suited to that purpose. The feet and hands were quite flexible and agile, however. 
Overnight before my first interview with the alien, the area had been transformed into a buzzing hive of activity. There were a dozen men working on setting up lights and camera equipment. A motion picture camera and microphone and tape recorder was there, also set up in the interview room. I don't know why a microphone was needed since there were no verbal communications possible with the alien. There was also a stenographer and several people busy typing on typewriters. I was informed that an expert foreign language interpreter and a code-breaking team had been flown to the base during the night to assist with my efforts to communicate with the alien. There were also several medical personnel, specialists in various fields, to examine the alien. And a professor of psychology was there to help formulate questions and interpret the answers. As I was just a nurse, I was not considered to be a qualified interpreter, even though I was the only one there who could understand anything the alien was thinking. There were many subsequent conversations between us. Each interview resulted in an exponential increase in the understanding between us, as I will discuss later on in my notes. This is the first transcript with the answers to a list of questions provided to me by the intelligence officer at the base, which I debriefed to the stenographer immediately following the interview. Official Transcript of Interview, Top Secret, Official Transcript of the U.S. Army, Air Force Roswell Army Airfield, 509th Bomb Group, Subject, Alien Interview, July 9, 1947. Question, Are You Injured? Answer, No. Question, What medical assistance do you require? Answer, None. Question, Do you need food or water or other sustenance? Answer, No. Question, do you have any special environmental needs such as air temperature, atmospheric chemical content, air pressure, or waste elimination? Answer, no, I am not a biological being. Question, does your body or spacecraft carry any germs or contamination that might be harmful to humans or other Earth life forms? Answer, no germs in space. Question, does your government know you are here? Answer, not at this time. Question, are others of your kind going to come looking for you? Answer, yes. Question, what is the weapons capability of your people? Answer, very destructive. I did not understand the exact nature of the kind of arms or weapons that they might have, but I did not feel that there was any malevolent intention in her reply, just a statement of fact. Question, why did your spacecraft crash? Answer, it was struck by an electrical discharge from the atmosphere, which caused us to lose control. Question, why was your spacecraft in this area? Answer, investigation of burning clouds, radiation, explosions. Question, how does your spacecraft fly? Answer, it is controlled through mind, responds to thought commands. Mind or thought command are the only English language words I can think of to describe the thought. Their bodies and I think the spacecraft are connected directly to them through some kind of electrical nervous system that they control with their own thoughts. Question, how do your people communicate with each other? Answer, through mind, thought. The words mind and thought combined together are the closest English language words I can think of to describe the idea at this time. However, it is very obvious to me that they communicate directly from the mind, just as she is communicating with me. Question, do you have a written language or symbols for communication? Answer, yes. Question, what planet are you from? Answer, the home, birthplace world of the domain. Since I am not an astronomer, I have no way of thinking in terms of stars, galaxies, constellations, and directions in space. The impression I received was of a planet in the center of a huge cluster of galaxies that is to her like home or birthplace. The word domain is the closest word I can think of to describe her concept, images, and thoughts about where she is from. It could as easily be called the territory or the realm. However, I'm sure that it was not just a planet or a solar system or a cluster of stars, but an enormous number of galaxies. Question, will your government send representatives to meet with our leaders? Answer, no. Question, what are your intentions concerning Earth? Answer, preserve, protect property of the domain. Question, what have you learned about Earth governments and military installations? Answer, poor, small, destroyed planet. Question, why haven't your people made your existence known to the people of Earth? Answer, watch, observe, no contact. I got the impression that contact with people on Earth was not permitted, but I could not think of a word or idea that communicated the impression I got exactly. They are just observing us. Question, 
Have your people visited Earth previously? Answer. Periodic. Repeating observations. Question. How long have you known about Earth? Answer. Long before humans. I'm not sure if the word prehistoric would be more accurate, but it was definitely a very long period of time before human beings evolved. Question. What do you know about the history of civilization on Earth? Answer. Small interest. Attention. Small time. The answer to this question seemed very vague to me. However, I perceived that her interest in Earth history is not very strong or that she did not pay much attention to it. Or maybe, I don't know, I really didn't get an answer to the question. Question. Can you describe your home world to us? Answer. Place of civilization, culture, history, large planet, wealth, resources always, order, power, knowledge, wisdom, two stars, three moons. Question. What is the state of development of your civilization? Answer. Ancient. Trillions of years. Always. Above all others. Plan. Schedule. Progress. Win. High goals. Ideas. I use the number trillions because I am sure that the meaning was a number larger than many billions. The idea of the length of time she communicated is beyond me. It's really closer to the idea of infinity in terms of earth years. Question. Do you believe in God? Answer. We think it is. Make it continue. Always. I am sure that the alien being does not understand the concept of God or worship as we do. I assume that the people in her civilization were all atheists. My impression was that they think very highly of themselves and are very prideful indeed. Question. What type of society do you have? Answer. Order. Power. Future always. Control. Grow. These are the closest words I can use to describe the idea she had about her own society or civilization. Her emotion when communicating her response to this question became very intense, very bright and emphatic. Her thought was filled with an emotion that gave me a feeling of jubilation or joy, but it made me very nervous also. Question. Are there other intelligent life forms besides yourself in the universe? Answer. Everywhere. We are greatest, highest of all. Due to her small stature, I'm sure that she did not mean tallest or biggest. Again, her prideful nature showed through in the feeling that I received from her. Matilda O'Donnell McElroy Personal Note This was the conclusion of the first interview. When the answers to the first list of questions were typed and given to the people who were waiting for them, they were very excited that I was able to get the alien to say anything. However, after they finished reading my answers, they were disappointed that I could not understand more clearly. Now they had a lot of new questions because of the answers I received to the first list of questions. An officer told me to await further instructions. I waited several hours in the adjoining office. I was not allowed to continue my interview with the alien. However, I was always well treated and allowed to eat and sleep and use the restroom facilities whenever I wanted. Eventually, a new list of questions was written for me to ask the alien. I gathered that quite a few other agents, government and military officials had arrived at the base by this time. They told me that several other people would be in the room with me during the next interview so they could prompt me to ask for more detail during the interview. However, when I attempted to conduct the interview with these people in the room, I received no thoughts, emotions or any other perceptible communication from the alien. Nothing. The alien just sat in a chair without moving. We all left the interview room. The intelligence agent became very agitated about this. He accused me of lying or making up the answers to the first questions. I insisted that all my answers were honest and as accurate as I could make them. Later that day, it was decided that several other people would attempt to ask questions of the alien. However, in spite of several attempts by different experts, no one else was ever able to get any communication at all from the alien. Over the next several days, a psychic research scientist from back east was flown to the base to interview the alien. Her name was Gertrude something or other. I don't remember the last name. On another occasion, an Indian clairvoyant named Krishnamurti came to the base to try to communicate with the alien. Neither one was successful at getting the alien to communicate anything. I was personally not able to communicate telepathically with either of these people either although I did not think that Mr. Krishnamurti was a very kind and intelligent gentleman. Finally, it was decided that I should be left with the alien by myself to see if I could get any answers.
Chapter 2, My Second Interview In the next interview, I was told to ask the alien only one question. Official transcript of interview. Top secret. Official transcript of the U.S. Army Air Force, Roswell Army Airfield, 509th Bomb Group. Subject, Alien Interview, July 10th, 1947. Question. Why have you stopped communicating? Answer. No stop. Others. Hidden. Covered. Secret fear. The alien cannot communicate with them because they were afraid of her or did not trust her. And it is clear to me that the alien is not aware that some people have secret intentions toward her and are hiding their real thoughts. It is equally obvious to me that the alien does not have even a tiny bit of fear of us, or anything else for that matter. Matilda O'Donnell McElroy, Personal Note I pondered the words I chose to convey the meaning of the alien's thoughts very carefully before reporting to the stenographer and the people who were waiting anxiously in the other room. Personally, I never suffered any fear or misapprehension about the alien whatsoever. I was very, very curious and excited to learn anything and everything I could about her and from her. However, like the aliens, I did not have much trust or confidence in the agents or authorities who were controlling my interviews. I had no idea what their intentions toward her might be. However, I am sure that the military officers were very, very nervous about having an alien spacecraft and pilot on their hands. At that moment, my greatest worry was how to more clearly understand the thoughts and ideas of the alien. I think that I was doing pretty well as a telepathic receiver, but not as good as a telepathic sender. I wanted desperately to figure out a better way to communicate with the alien, in a way that would enable the growing legion of government officials to understand her more directly, without having to rely on my interpretation of her thoughts. I did not feel very well qualified to act as an interpreter, yet I was the only person with whom the alien would communicate so it was up to me to get the job done. I was also becoming acutely aware that this was probably the biggest news event in the history of the Earth, and that I should be proud to have had any part in it. Of course, by that time the entire incident had been officially denied in the press, and a cover-up of immense proportions by the military and the powers that be had already begun. However, I was beginning to feel the pressure of the responsibility for being the first person on Earth, as far as I knew, to communicate with an extraterrestrial life form. I think I know how Columbus must have felt when he discovered a new world the size of a continent on one small planet, but I was able to discover an entirely new unexplored universe. While I waited for my next instructions from my superiors, I went to my quarters under escort of several heavily armed MPs. Several other men dressed in black suits and ties accompanied me also. They were still there when I got up in the morning. After breakfast, which was brought to me in my own quarters, they escorted me back to the office at the base that was used for the interview. Roswell, Alien Interview, Chapter 3, 
My third interview, Matilda O'Donnell McElroy, personal note. The third interview and all subsequent interviews that I had with the alien were observed and recorded, as I mentioned above, by dozens of other people. Although they were not physically present, a special room had been constructed with a window of one-way glass through which the interview could be observed from an adjoining room without intruding on the alien. The alien had been moved into a newly constructed room and was seated in an ordinary overstuffed living room chair covered with a flowery fabric. I'm sure that someone had been sent into town to buy a chair from the nearest available furniture store. The alien's body was about the same size as a very thin five-year-old child, so she was dwarfed by the chair. Since her body was not biological, it didn't need any food, air, or heat, and apparently she didn't sleep either. There were no eyelids or eyebrows above her eyes, so the eyes didn't close. I don't think anyone could tell whether she was sleeping or awake as long as she was sitting upright in the chair. Unless she moved her body or gestured with her hand, it would be hard to tell whether she was even alive or not unless you could perceive her thoughts. Eventually, I learned that the alien was not identified by her body, but by her personality, so to speak. She was known by her fellow aliens as Errol. This is the closest word I can use to describe the name using the English alphabet. I sense that she preferred the feminine gender. I think we shared a natural female empathy and nurturing attitude toward life and each other. I am sure she did not feel comfortable with the combative, aggressive, domineering attitude of the male officers and agents, each of whom was more concerned with their own personal self-importance and power than with discovering the secrets of the universe. When I entered the room, she was very pleased to see me. I felt a very genuine sense of recognition, relief, and a warm feeling from her. It was like the eager excitement and unconditional platonic affection one feels from a dog or a child, yet with a calm and reserved control. I must say that I was surprised that I felt the same sort of affection for the alien being, especially since we had spent so little time with each other. I was pleased that I was able to continue my interviews with her in spite of all the attention it was getting from the stream of government and military people arriving at the base. It was very obvious that the people who wrote the next series of questions for me wanted to learn how to communicate with the alien themselves without having to go through me. Here are the answers to the new list of questions. Official transcript of interview, top secret. Official transcript of the U.S. Army Air Force Roswell Army Airfield 509th Bomb Group. Subject, alien interview, July 11, 1947. Question, can you read or write any Earth languages? Answer, no. Question, do you understand numbers or mathematics? Answer, yes, I'm an officer, pilot, engineer. Question, can you write or draw symbols or pictures that we may be able to translate into our own language? Answer, uncertain. Question, are there any other signs or means of communication you can use to help us understand your thoughts more clearly? Answer, no. Matilda O'Donnell McElroy, personal note. I was very sure that this was not true, but I understand clearly that Errol was not willing to communicate in writing or drawing or sign language. My feeling was that she was following orders like any soldier who had been captured not to reveal any information that might be useful to an enemy, even under torture. She was only able and willing to reveal non-confidential or personal information or name, rank, and serial number. Official transcript of interview, top secret. Official transcript of the U.S. Army Air Force Roswell Army Airfield, 509th Bomb Group. Subject, alien interview, July 11th, 1947, second session. Question, can you show us on a map of the stars which is the star of your home planet? Answer, no. This is not because she does not know the directions from Earth to her home planet. She was unwilling to reveal the location. It was also due to the fact that the star system of her home planet does not exist on any star map on Earth. It's too far away. Question. How long will it take your people to locate you here? Answer. Unknown. Question. How long would it take your people to travel here to rescue you? Answer. Minutes or hours. Question. How can we make them understand that we do not intend to harm you? Answer. Intentions are clear. See in your mind. Images. Feelings. Question. If you are not a biological entity, why do you refer to yourself as feminine? 
Answer. I am a creator, mother, source. Matilda O'Donnell McElroy, personal note. These questions only took me a few minutes to complete. I realized then that we may be in for some serious trouble if the alien was not willing to cooperate or reveal any information that the military or intelligence agencies or scientists consider to be useful to them. I was also sure that the alien was very certain of the actual intentions of the people who wrote these questions, as she could read their minds just as easily as she could read my thoughts and communicate with me telepathically. Because of these intentions, she was unwilling and unable to cooperate with any of them in any way under any circumstances. And I am equally sure that since she is not a biological life form, that there was no kind of torture or coercion that would change her mind. Roswell, Alien Interview, Chapter 4, The Language Barrier, Matilda O'Donnell McElroy, Personal Note. After I explained what I thought were the reasons for the no answer, answer to the intelligence agents. There was a great deal of upset and turmoil. A very heated discussion took place between some of the intelligence officers, military officials, psychologists, and the language interpreters. This lasted for several hours. It was finally decided that I should be allowed to continue to interview the alien, provided I could get a satisfactory answer from her to the following question. Official transcript of interview, top secret, Official transcript of the U.S. Army Air Force, Roswell Army Airfield, 509th Bomb Group, subject, Alien Interview, July 11, 1947, third session. Question, what assurance or proof do you require from us that will make you feel safe enough to answer our questions? Answer, only she speaks, only she hears, only she questions, no others. Must learn, know, understand. Matilda O'Donnell McElroy, personal note. When I returned to the interview room to report the alien response to this question, I received a grim and skeptical reception from the assembled intelligence agents and military personnel. They could not understand what the alien meant by this. I admitted that I really couldn't understand what she meant either, but I was doing the best that I could to articulate her telepathic intentions. I told the officials that perhaps the communication problem had to do with my inability to understand the telepathic language of the alien clearly enough to be satisfactory. I was so discouraged at that point I almost felt like giving up. And now there was even more arguments than before. I was sure I was going to be removed from my position in spite of the fact that the alien refused to communicate with anyone else or that no one else had been found who could communicate with her. Fortunately, a very clever fellow named John Newble, who was a Japanese language specialist from the Navy, had an explanation and a solution to the problem. He explained that first the problem had very little to do with the inability of the alien to communicate. It had more to do with her unwillingness to communicate with anyone other than myself. Second, in order for any clear, comprehensive communication to happen, both parties needed to understand and communicate through a common language. Words and symbols and language convey very precise concepts and meanings. He said that the Japanese people have a lot of homonyms in their language, which cause a lot of confusion in day-to-day -day communication. They solve this problem by using standard Chinese characters to write down the exact meaning of the word they are using. This clears up the matter for them. Without a defined nomenclature, communication was not possible beyond the rudimentary understanding between men and dogs or between two small children. The lack of a common vocabulary of clearly defined words that all parties can use fluently was the limiting factor in communication between all people, groups, or nations. Therefore, he suggested that there were only two choices. I had to learn to speak the language of the alien, or the alien had to learn to speak English. Factually, only one choice was possible, that I persuade Errol to learn English, and that I teach it to her with the guidance of the language specialist. No one had any objection to trying this approach, as there were no other suggestions. The language specialists 
suggested that I take several children's books and a basic reading primer and grammar text with me into the interview room. The plan was that I would sit next to the alien and read aloud to her from the books while pointing to the text I was reading with my finger so that she could follow along. The theory was that the alien could eventually be taught to read just as a child is taught to read by word and sound association with the written word as well as instruction in fundamental grammar. They also assumed, I think, that if the alien was intelligent enough to communicate with me telepathically and fly a spacecraft across the galaxy, that she could probably learn to speak a language as quickly as a five-year-old or faster. I returned to the interview room and proposed this idea to Errol. She did not object to learning the language, although she did not make any commitment to answer questions either. No one else had a better idea, so we went ahead. Roswell, Alien Interview, Chapter 5, Reading Lessons, Matilda O'Donnell McElroy, Personal Note. I began the reading lessons with the first pages of a book that had been used to teach pioneer children in the 1800s on the frontiers of America. It is called McGuffey's Eclectic Reader, Primer through Sixth. Since I am a nurse and not a teacher, the language expert who gave me the books also gave me an extensive briefing, a course that took an entire day, on how to use the books to teach the alien. He said the reason he chose these particular books was because the original 1836 version of these books were used for three quarters of a century to teach about four-fifths of all American school children how to read. No other books ever had so much influence over American children for so long. McGuffey's educational course begins in the primer by presenting the letters of the alphabet to be memorized in sequence. Children were then taught step by step to use the building blocks of the language to form and pronounce words using the phonics method, which involves teaching children to connect sounds with letters. Each lesson begins with a study of the words used in the reading exercise and with markings to show the correct pronunciation for each word. I discovered that the stories in the first and second readers picture children in their relationship with family members, teachers, friends, and animals. The third, fourth, fifth, and sixth readers expanded on those ideas. One of the stories I remember was The Widow and the Merchant. It's kind of a morality tale about a merchant who befriends a widow in need. Later, when the widow proves herself to be honest, the merchant gives her a nice gift. The books do not necessarily teach you to believe that charity is expected only of wealthy, though. We all know that generosity is a virtue that should be practiced by everyone. All of the stories were very wholesome, and they gave very good explanations to illustrate virtues like honesty, charity, thrift, hard work, courage, patriotism, reverence for God, and respect for parents. Personally, I would recommend this book to anyone. I also discovered that the vocabulary used in the book was very advanced compared to the relatively limited number of words people use commonly in our modern age. I think that we have lost a lot of our own language since our founding fathers wrote the Declaration of Independence over 200 years ago. As instructed, I sat next to Errol in the interview room, reading aloud to her from each successive book in the series of the McGuffey Readers. Each of the books had excellent, simple illustrations of the stories and subjects being taught, although they are very outdated by today's standards. Nonetheless, Errol seemed to understand and absorb every word, sound, syllable, and meaning as we progressed. We continued this process for 14 hours a day for three consecutive days without interruption, except for a few meals and rest breaks on my part. Errol did not take breaks for anything. She did not sleep. Instead, she remained sitting in the overstuffed chair in the interview room, reviewing the lessons we already covered. When I returned each morning to begin where we'd left off, she had already memorized the previous lessons and was well into the next pages. This pattern continued to accelerate until it became pointless for me to continue reading to her. Although Errol did not have a mouth to speak with, she was now able to think at me in English. At the end of these lessons, Errol was able to read and study by herself. 
I showed her how to use a dictionary to look up new words she encountered. Errol consulted the dictionary continually after that. From then on, my job was acting as a courier for her, requesting that reference books be brought to her in a steady stream. Next, Mr. Newble brought in a set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Errol especially enjoyed this because it had a lot of pictures. After that, she requested many more picture books and reference books with photographs and drawings because it was much easier to understand the meaning if she could see a picture of the thing she was studying. Over the next six days, books were brought in from libraries all over the country, I presume, because it wasn't more than a few more days before she had read through several hundred of them. She studied every subject I could imagine and many other very technical things I never wanted to know anything about, like astronomy, metallurgy, engineering, mathematics, various technical manuals, and so forth. Later she began to read fiction books, novels, poetry, and the classics of literature. Errol also asked to read a great many books on the subjects in the humanities, especially history. I think she must have read at least 50 books about human history and archaeology. Of course, I made sure that she received a copy of the Holy Bible also, which she read from cover to cover without comment or questions. Although I continued to stay with Errol for 12 to 14 hours each day, most of that time during the following week had been spent without much communication between us, except for an occasional question she asked me. The questions were usually meant to give her a sense of context or to clarify something in the books she was reading. Oddly, Errol told me that her favorite books were Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, Don Quixote's De La Mancha, and One Thousand and One Nights. She said the authors of these stories showed that it is more important to have a great spirit and imagination than great skill or power. I could not answer a lot of her questions, so I consulted with people in the outer rooms for answers. Most of these had to do with technical and scientific things. A few of her questions were about the humanities. The depth of complex understanding and subtlety of her questions showed that she had a very penetrating intellect. Personally, I think she had already known a lot more about the culture and history of Earth than she was willing to admit when we started. I would soon discover how much more. Roswell, Alien Interview, Chapter 9, A Timeline of Events, Matilda O'Donnell McElroy, Personal Note. For this interview, I took written notes because Errol gave me a lot of dates and names that I couldn't possibly remember without writing them down. I didn't usually take notes, but during this lesson, I thought it was important to get the information exactly as she gave it to me. However, I discovered that my note-taking made it much more difficult for me to focus on receiving the communication from Errol. I was sometimes so distracted by my own writing that I lost the train of her thought, so I had to ask her to repeat herself several times. Errol continued to stay in communication with the communications officer on the asteroid belt station, from which she received much of this information. Since Errol was an officer, pilot, and engineer of the domain, and not a historian, she had to get this information from records of reconnaissance missions conducted by other officers of the domain expeditionary force. Official transcript of interview, top secret. The actual history of Earth is very bizarre. It's so nonsensical that it is incredible to anyone on Earth who attempts to investigate it. A myriad of vital information is missing from it. A huge conglomeration of non-sequitur relics and mythology has been arbitrarily introduced into it. The volatile nature of the Earth itself cyclically covers, drowns, mixes, and shreds physical evidence. These factors, combined with amnesia, post-hypnotic suggestions, false facades, and cover manipulation, make a reconstruction of the factual origins and history of Earth civilizations virtually indecipherable. 
Any investigator, no matter how brilliant, is doomed to wallow in a quagmire of inconclusive assumptions, unworkable hypotheses, and perpetual mystery. Since the domain does not suffer these afflictions, having the advantage of memory, longevity, and an exterior point of view, I will add some clarification to your fragmentary knowledge of the history of Earth. These are some of the dates and events that are not mentioned in Earth history textbooks. These dates are significant because they provide some information concerning the influences of the old empire and of the domain on Earth. Although I have attended several briefings by our mission control personnel on the general background of the Earth within the past few hundred years, I will rely principally on data gathered from records captured after our invasion of the old empire planetary headquarters. Since that time, the Domain Expeditionary Force has tracked the general progress of events on Earth. As I mentioned, in some cases the Domain has chosen to intervene in certain affairs on Earth in order to ensure the success of our long-term expansion plans. Although the Domain has no interest in Earth per se, or the population of Isbees on this planet, it does serve our interests to ensure that the resources of Earth are not destroyed or spoiled. To that end, certain officers of the Domain have been sent to Earth on reconnaissance missions from time to time to gather information. However, the following dates and events have been extrapolated from the accumulated information in the data files of the Domain, at least those that are accessible to me through the Space Station Communications Center. 208,000 BCE The establishment of the old empire whose headquarters were located near one of the tail stars of the Ursa Major Big Dipper constellation of this galaxy. The old empire invasion force conquered the area with nuclear weapons sometime earlier. After the radioactivity subsided and the cleanup and restoration were completed, it received the immigration of beings from another galaxy into this galaxy. Those beings set up a society that kept going until about 10,000 years ago when it was superseded by the domain. Very recently, Earth civilization has come to resemble aspects of that civilization now that it has fallen out of its immediate control. In particular, the appearance and technology of transportation such as planes, trains, ships, fire engines, and automobiles, as well as what you consider to be modern or futuristic architecture which emulate the design of buildings in the major cities of the old empire. Before 75,000 BCE, the domain records contain very little information about the civilizations on the continental land masses of Atlanta and Lemur, except to note that they did coexist on Earth at more or less the same time. Apparently, both civilizations were founded by remnants of electronic space opera cultures who fled from their native planetary systems to escape political or religious persecution. The Domain knows that a long-standing edict of the old empire prohibits unauthorized colonization of planets. Therefore, it is possible that their destruction was caused by police or military forces who pursued the colonists as criminals and destroyed them. Although this seems a likely supposition, no conclusive evidence exists that explains the complete destruction and disappearance of two entire electronic civilizations. Another possibility is that a massive submarine volcanic eruption in the region of Lake Toba in Sumatra and Mount Krakatoa in Java caused the destruction of Lemur. The floodwaters caused by the eruption overwhelmed all the land masses, including the highest mountains. Survivors of the destruction of the civilization, the Lemurians, are the earliest ancestors of the Chinese. Australia and the ocean areas to the north were the center of the Lemurian civilization and are the source of the Oriental races. Both civilizations possessed electronics, flight, and similar technologies of space opera cultures. Apparently, the volcanic eruption expelled such a significant mass of molten rock that the resulting vacuum beneath the crust of Earth caused great areas of the land masses to sink below the oceans. The continental areas occupied by both civilizations were covered with volcanic matter and then submerged, leaving very little evidence that they ever existed except for legends of a global flood which prevail in every culture of the earth and for survivors who are the genus of the oriental races and cultures. That kind of colossal volcanic explosion fills the stratosphere with toxic gases which are carried around the whole planet. 
The usual refuse of these volcanic eruptions can easily cause a rain that lasts 40 days and 40 nights due to atmospheric pollution, as well as an extensive period during which radiation from the sun is deflected back into space and causes global cooling. Certainly such an event would cause an ice age, extinctions of life forms, and many other relatively long-term changes lasting thousands of years. Due to the myriad types of naturally occurring global cataclysmic events which are indigenous to Earth, it is not a suitable planet for habitation by ISBEs. In addition, there have been occasional global cataclysms caused by ISBEs, such as the one that destroyed the dinosaurs more than 70 million years ago. That destruction was caused by an intergalactic warfare, during which time Earth and many other neighboring moons and planets were bombarded by atomic weapons. Atomic explosions cause atmospheric fallout much like that of volcanic eruptions. Most of the planets in this sector of the galaxy have been uninhabitable deserts since then. Earth is undesirable for many other reasons, heavy gravity and dense atmosphere, floods, earthquakes, volcanoes, polar shifts, continental drift, meteor impacts, atmospheric and climatic changes to name a few. What kind of lasting civilization could any sophisticated culture propose to develop in such an environment? In addition, Earth is a small planet of a rim star of a galaxy. This makes Earth very isolated geographically from the more concentrated planetary civilizations which exist toward the center of the galaxy. These obvious facts have made Earth suitable for use only as a zoological or botanical garden or for its current use as a prison, but not much else. Before 30,000 years BCE, Earth started being used as a dumping ground and prison for Isbees who were judged untouchable, meaning criminal or nonconformists. Isbees were captured, encapsulated in electronic traps, and transported to Earth from various parts of the old empire. Underground amnesia stations were set up on Mars and on Earth in the Renzori Mountains in Africa, in the Pyrenees Mountains of Portugal, and in steppes of Mongolia. These electronic monitoring points create force screens designed to detect and capture ISBEs when the ISBE departs the body at death. ISBEs are brainwashed using extreme electronic force in order to maintain Earth's population in a state of perpetual amnesia. Further population controls are installed through the use of long-range electronic thought control mechanisms. These stations are still in operation, and they are extremely difficult to attack or destroy, even for the domain, which will not maintain a significant military force in this area until a later date. The pyramid civilizations were intentionally created as a part of the ISB prison system on Earth. The pyramid is alleged to be the symbol for wisdom. However, the wisdom of the old empire on planet Earth is intended to operate as part of the elaborate amnesia trap, consisting of mass, meaning, and mystery. These are opposite to the qualities of an immortal spiritual being which has no mass or meaning. An isbi is solely because it thinks that it is. Mass represents the physical universe including objects such as stars, planets, gases, liquids, energy particles, and teacups. The pyramids were very, very solid objects, as were all the structures created by the old empire. Heavy, massive, dense, solid objects create the illusion of eternity. Dead bodies wrapped in linen, soaked in resin, placed inside engraved golden coffins, and entombed with earthly possessions amid cryptic symbols create an illusion of eternal life. However, dense, heavy physical universe symbols are the exact opposite of an isbi. An isbi has no mass or time. Objects do not endure forever. An isbi is forever. Meaning. False meanings prevent knowledge of the truth. The pyramid cultures of Earth are a fabricated illusion. They are nothing more than false civilizations contrived by the old empire, mystery cult, called the Brothers of the Serpent. False meanings were invented to create the illusion of a false society to further reinforce the amnesia mechanism among the inmates in the Earth prison system. Mystery is built of lies and half-truths. Lies cause persistence because they alter facts which are comprised of exact dates, places, and events. When truth is known, a lie no longer persists. If the exact truth is revealed, it is no longer a mystery. All of the pyramid civilizations of Earth were carefully contrived 
of layer upon layer of lies skillfully combined with a few truths. The priest cult of the old empire combines sophisticated mathematics and space opera technology with their theatrical metaphors and symbolism. All of these are complete fabrications of truth baited with the allure of aesthetics and mystery. The intricate rituals, astronomical alignments, secret rites, massive monuments, marvelous architecture, artistically rendered hieroglyphs, and man-animal gods were designed to create an unsolvable mystery for the Isby prison population on Earth. The mystery diverts attention away from the truth that Isbys have been captured, given amnesia, and imprisoned on a planet far, far away from their home. The truth is that every single Isby on Earth came to Earth from some other planetary system. Not one person on Earth is a native inhabitant. Human beings did not evolve on Earth. In the past, Egyptian society was run by the prison administrators or priests who in turn manipulated a pharaoh, controlled the treasury, and kept the inmate population enslaved physically and spiritually. In modern times, the priests have changed, but the function is the same. However, now the priests are prisoners too. Mystery reinforces the walls of the prison. The old empire feared that the Isbis on earth might regain their memory. Therefore, one of the primary functions of the old empire priesthood is to prevent Isbees on earth from remembering who they really are, how they came to earth, where they came from. The old empire operators of the prison system and their superiors do not want Isbees to remember who murdered them, captured them, stole all of their possessions, sent them to earth, gave them amnesia, and condemned them to eternal imprisonment. Imagine what would happen if all the inmates in the prison suddenly remembered that they have the right to be free. What if they suddenly realized that they have been falsely imprisoned and rise up as one against the guards? They are afraid to reveal anything that looks like the civilization of the inmates' home planets. A body, a piece of clothing, a symbol, a spaceship, an advanced electronics device, or any other remnant of civilization from a home planet could remind a being and rekindle his memory. Sophisticated technologies of entrapment and enslavement, which were developed over millions of years in the old empire, have been applied to the Isbees on Earth with the intention to create a false facade for the prison. These facades were installed on Earth in totality all at once. Every piece is a fully integrated part of the prison system. This includes a religion of mumbo-jumbo doublespeak, Every pyramid civilization uses this as part of a control mechanism to keep the population enslaved by force, by fear, and by ignorance. Roswell, Alien Interview, Chapter 7, A Lesson in Ancient History, Matilda O'Donnell McElroy, Personal Note. My instruction with Errol continued through the night until dawn of the next morning. I must say that I was fascinated, skeptical, shocked, alarmed, dismayed, and disgruntled by the lesson I was getting from Errol. I could never have imagined any of what she was telling me, not even in my wildest dreams and nightmares. The next afternoon, after I had slept, showered, and eaten, I was debriefed about my interview session the previous evening by members of the gallery who recorded my account of what Errol told me. There was a stenographer present for the session as usual to whom I debriefed after each interview, and there were also six or seven men who asked for clarification of my statements. As always, there was constant pressure applied to me to use my influence with Errol to persuade her to answer specific questions prompted by members of the gallery. I did my best to reassure everyone that I would give my very best efforts to do so. Nevertheless, only three things happened every day thereafter. Errol resolutely refused to answer any questions that she sensed had been posed by or suggested to me by the gallery. 2. Errol continued to instruct me in the subject matter of her own choice. 
Three, every evening after my interview with or instruction from Errol, she would give me a new list of subject matter about which she wanted more information. Each evening, I presented this list to the gallery. The next day, Errol received a large stack of books, magazines, articles, and so forth. She would study all of these during the night while I slept. This pattern repeated every day during the remainder of the time I spent with her. The subject matter of my next interview or lesson from Errol continued with a brief history of Earth, our solar system, and nearby space from the perspective of the domain. Official transcript of interview, top secret. Official transcript of the U.S. Army Air Force Roswell Army Airfield 509th Bomb Group, subject alien interview, July 25, 1947, first session. Before you can understand the subject of history, you must first understand the subject of time. Time is simply an arbitrary measurement of the motion of objects through space. Space is not linear. Space is determined by point of view of an isby when viewing an object. The distance between an isby and the object being viewed is called space. Objects or energy masses in space do not necessarily move in a linear fashion. In this universe, objects tend to move randomly or in a curving or cyclical pattern or as determined by agreed-upon rules. History is not only a linear record of events, as many authors of Earth history books imply, because it is not a string that can be stretched out and marked like a measuring tool. History is a subjective observation of the movement of objects through space recorded from the point of view of a survivor rather than those who succumbed. Events occur interactively and concurrently just as the biological body has a heart that pumps blood while the lungs provide oxygen to the cells which reproduce using energy from the sun and chemicals from plants at the same time as the liver strains toxic wastes from the blood and eliminates them through the bladder and the bowels. All of these interactions are concurrent and simultaneous. Although time runs consecutively, events do not happen in an independent linear stream. In order to view and understand the history or reality of the past, one must view all the events as part of an interactive whole. Time can also be sensed as a vibration, which is uniform throughout the entire physical universe. Errol explained that isbies have been around since before the beginning of the universe. The reason that they are called immortal is because a spirit is not born and cannot die, but exists in a personally postulated perception of is, will be. She was careful to explain that every spirit is not the same. Each is completely unique in identity, power, awareness, and ability. The difference between an isbe like Errol and most of the isbe's inhabiting bodies on earth is that Errol can enter and depart from her doll at will. She can perceive at selective depths through matter. Errol and other officers of the domain can communicate telepathically. Since an ISBE is not a physical universe entity, it has no location in space or time. An ISBE is literally immaterial. They can span great distances of space instantly. They can experience sensations more intensely than a biological body without the use of physical sensory mechanisms. An SB can exclude pain from their perception. Errol can also remember her identity, so to speak, all the way back into the dim mists of time for trillions of years. She says that the existing collection of suns in this immediate vicinity of the universe have been burning for the last 200 trillion years. The age of the physical universe is nearly infinitely old, but probably at least four quadrillion years since its earliest beginnings. Time is a difficult factor to measure as it depends on the subjective memory of ISBEs, and there has been no uniform record of events throughout the physical universe since it began. As on Earth, there are many different time measurement systems defined by various cultures, which use cycles of motion and points of origin to establish age and duration. 
The physical universe itself is formed from the convergence and amalgamation of many other individual universes, each of which were created by an isbi or group of isbis. The collision of these illusionary universes commingled and coalesced and were solidified to form a mutually created universe. Because it is agreed that energy and forms can be created but not destroyed, this creative process has continued to form an ever-expanding universe of nearly infinite physical proportions. Before the formation of the physical universe, there was a vast period during which universes were not solid, but wholly illusionary. You might say that the universe was a universe of magic illusions, which were made to appear and vanish at the will of the magician. In every case, the magician was one or more isbis. Many isbis on earth can still recall vague images from that period. Tales of magic, sorcery, and enchantment Fairy tales and mythology speak of such things, although in very crude terms. Each Isbi entered into the physical universe when they lost their own home universe. That is, when an Isbi's home universe was overwhelmed by the physical universe, or when the Isbi joined with other Isbis to create or conquer the physical universe. On earth, the ability to determine when an Isbi entered the physical universe is difficult for two reasons. One, the memory of Isbis on Earth have been erased, and two, Isbis arrival or invasion into the physical universe took place at different times some 60 trillion years ago, and others only 3 trillion. Every once in a short while, a few million years, an area or planet will be taken over by another group of Isbis entering into the area. Sometimes they will capture other Isbis as slaves. They will be forced to inhibit bodies to perform menial or manual work, especially mining mineral ores on heavy gravity planets such as Earth. Errol says that she has been a member of the Domain Expeditionary Force for more than 625 million years. When she became a pilot for a biological survey mission, which included occasional visits to Earth, she can remember her entire career there and for a very long time before that. She told me that Earth scientists do not have an accurate measuring system to gauge the age of matter. They assume that because certain types of materials seem to deteriorate rather quickly, such as organic or carbon-based matter, that there is a deterioration of matter. It is not accurate to measure the age of stone based on the measurement of the age of wood or bone. This is a fundamental error. Factually, matter does not deteriorate, it cannot be destroyed. Matter can only be altered in form, but it is never truly destroyed. The Domain has conducted a periodic survey of the galaxies in this sector of the universe since it developed space travel technologies about 80 trillion years ago. A review of changes in the complexion of Earth revealed that mountain ranges rise and fall, continents change location, the poles of the planet shift Ice caps come and go, oceans appear and disappear, rivers, valleys, and canyons change. In all cases, the matter is the same. It is always the same sand. Every form and substance is made of the same basic materials which never deteriorates. Matilda O'Donnell McElroy, Personal Note I cannot even begin to imagine how advanced a civilization may have become technically and mentally after trillions of years. Just think of how advanced our own country has become compared to only 150 years ago. Only a few generations ago, transportation was on foot, horseback, or boat. Reading was done by candlelight. Heating and cooking were done over a fireplace, and there wasn't any indoor plumbing. Official Transcript of Interview Errol described the abilities of an ISB officer of the domain to me, and she demonstrated one to me when she contacted telepathically a communications officer of the domain who was stationed in the asteroid belt. The asteroid belt is composed of thousands of broken up pieces of a planet that once existed between Mars and Jupiter. It serves as a good low gravity jumping off point for incoming spacecraft traveling toward the center of our galaxy. She requested that this officer consult information stored in the files of the domain concerning the history of Earth. She asked the communications officer to feed this information to Errol. 
The communications officer immediately complied with the request. Based on the information stored in the files of the domain, Errol was able to give me a brief overview of our history lesson. This is what Errol told me that the domain had observed about the history of Earth. She told me that the domain expeditionary force first entered into the Milky Way galaxy very recently, only about 10,000 years ago. The first action was to conquer the home planets of the old empire. This is not the official name, but a nickname given to the conquered civilization by the domain forces that served as the seat of central government for this galaxy and other adjoining regions of space. These planets are located in the star's systems in the tail of the Big Dipper constellation. She did not mention which stars exactly. About 1500 years later, the Domain began the installation bases for their own forces along the path of invasion which leads towards the center of the galaxy and beyond. About 8,200 years ago, the Domain forces set up a base on Earth in the Himalaya Mountains near the border of modern Pakistan and Afghanistan. This was a base for the battalion of the Domain Expeditionary Force, which included about 3,000 members. They set up a base under or inside the top of the mountain. The mountain top was drilled into and made hollow to create an area large enough to house the ships and personnel of that force. An electronic illusion of the mountain top was created to hide the base by projecting a false image from inside the mountain against a force screen. The ships could then enter and exit through the force screen, yet remain unseen by Homo sapiens. Shortly after they settled there, the base was surprised by an attack from a remnant of the military forces of the old empire. Unbeknownst to the Domain, a hidden underground base on Mars, operated by the Old Empire, had existed for a very long time. The Domain base was wiped out by a military attack from the Mars base, and the Isbees of the Domain Expeditionary Force were captured. You can imagine that the Domain was very upset about losing such a large force of officers and crew, so they sent other crews to Earth to look for them. Those crews were also attacked. The captured Isbees from the Domain forces were handled in the same fashion as all other Isbees who have been sent to Earth. They were each given amnesia, had their memories replaced with false pictures and hypnotic commands, and sent to Earth to inhabit biological bodies. They are still a part of the human population today. After a very persistent and extensive investigation into the loss of their crews, the Domain discovered that Old World Empire has been operating a very extensive and very carefully hidden base of operations in this part of the galaxy for millions of years. No one knows exactly how long. Eventually the spacecraft of the Old Empire forces and the Domain engaged each other in open combat in the space of the solar system. According to Errol, there was a running battle between the Old Empire forces and the Domain until about 1235 A.D. when the Domain forces finally destroyed the last of the spacecraft of the Old Empire force in this area. The Domain Expeditionary Force lost many of its own ships in this area during that time also. About a thousand years later, the Old Empire base was discovered by accident in the spring of 1914 A.D. Roswell Alien Interview, Chapter 8, A Lesson in Recent History, Matilda O'Donnell McElroy, Personal Note. This interview taught me a history lesson I will never read in any textbook written on Earth. The Domain has a much different view of events than we do. Official Transcript of Interview, Top Secret. Official Transcript of the U.S. Army Air Force, Roswell Army Airfield, 509th Bomb Group, Subject, Alien Interview. July 26, 1947, first session. The Domain Expeditionary Force has observed the resurgence in science and culture of the Western world since 1150 A.D. when the remaining remnants of the space fleet of the old empire in this solar system were destroyed. The influence of the remote control hypnosis operation diminished slightly after that time, but still remains largely in force. Apparently a small amount of damage was done to the old world remote mind control operation, which resulted in a small decrease in the power of this mechanism. As a result, some memory of technologies that ISBEs already knew before they came to Earth started to be remembered. Thereafter, the oppression of knowledge that is called the Dark Ages in Europe began to diminish after that time. 
Since then, the knowledge of the basic laws of physics and electricity have revolutionized Earth culture virtually overnight. The ability to remember technology by many of the geniuses in the ISB population of Earth was partially restored, when not so actively suppressed as it was before 1150 A.D. Sir Isaac Newton is one of the best examples of this. In only a few decades, he single-handedly reinvented several major and fundamental scientific and mathematic principles. The men who remembered these sciences already knew them before they were sent to Earth. Ordinarily, no one would ever observe or discover as much about science and mathematics in a single lifetime or even a few hundred lifetimes. These subjects have taken civilians billions and billions of years to create. ISBs on Earth have only just begun to remember small fragments of all the technologies that exist throughout the universe. Theoretically, if the amnesia mechanisms being used against Earth could be broken entirely, ISBs would regain all their memory. Unfortunately, similar advances have not been seen in the humanities as the ISBs of Earth continue to behave very badly toward each other. This behavior, however, is heavily influenced by the hypnotic commands given to each ISB between lifetimes, and the very unusual combination of inmates on Earth, criminals, perverts, artists, revolutionaries, and geniuses, is the cause of a very restive and tumultuous environment. The purpose of the prison planet is to keep ISBs on Earth forever. Promoting ignorance, superstition, and war between ISBs helps keep the prison population crippled and trapped behind the wall of electronic force screens. ISBs have been dumped on Earth from all over the galaxy, adjoining galaxies, and from planetary systems all over the old empire, like Sirius, Aldebaran, the Pleiades, Orion, Draconis, and countless others. There are ISBs on Earth from unnamed races, civilizations, cultural backgrounds, and planetary environments. Each of the various ISB populations have their own language, belief systems, moral values, religious beliefs, training, and unknown and untold histories. These ISBs are mixed together with earlier inhabitants of Earth who came from another star system more than 400,000 years ago to establish the civilizations of Atlantis and Lemuria. Those civilizations vanished beneath the tidal waves caused by a planetary polar shift many thousands of years ago before the current prison population started to arrive. Apparently, the ISBs from those star systems were the source of the original oriental races of Earth beginning in Australia. On the other hand, the civilizations set up on Earth by the old empire prison system were very different from the civilization of the old empire itself, which is an electronic space opera, atomic-powered, conglomeration of earlier civilizations that were conquered with nuclear weapons and colonized by ISBs from another galaxy. The bureaucracy that controlled the former old empire was from an ancient space opera society run by a totalitarian confederation of planetary governments, regulated by a brutal social, economic, and political hierarchy with a royal monarch as its figurehead. This type of government emerges with regularity on planets where the citizens abandon personal responsibility for autonomous self-regulation. They frequently lose their freedom to demented ISBs who suffer from an overwhelming paranoia that every other ISB is their enemy who must be controlled or destroyed. Their closest friends and allies, whom they espouse to love and cherish, are literally loved to death by them. Because such ISBs exist, the domain has learned that freedom must be won and maintained through eternal vigilance and the ability to use defensive force to maintain it. As a result, the domain has already conquered the governing planet of the old empire. The civilization of the domain, although considerably younger and smaller in size, is already more powerful, better organized, and united by an egalitarian esprit de corps never known in the history of the old empire. The recently despoiled German totalitarian state on Earth was similar to the old empire, but not nearly as brutal, and about 10,000 times less powerful. Many of the ISBs on Earth are here because they are violently opposed to the totalitarian government, or because they were so psychotically vicious that they could not be controlled by the old empire government. Consequently, the population of Earth is disproportionately comprised of a very high percentage of such beings. The conflicting cultural and ethical moral codes of the ISBs on Earth is unusual in the extreme. The domain conquest of the central old empire planets was fought with electronic cannon. 
The citizens of the planet forming the core of government for the old empire are a filthy, degraded, slave society of mindless, tax-paying workers who practice cannibalism. Violent automotive racetracks and bloody Roman circus-type entertainments are their only amusements. Regardless of any reasonable justification we may have had for using atomic weapons to vanquish the planets of the old empire, the domain is careful not to ruin the resources of those planets by using weapons of crude radioactive force. The current U.S. civilization is beginning to mimic some of the trappings of that civilization, especially in the design of airplanes, automobiles, ships, trains, and telephones. Likewise, buildings in the cities of Earth are thought to be modern or futuristic if their design resembles the architecture of the old empire. The government of the old empire, before being supplanted by the domain, was comprised of beings who possessed a very craven intelligence, very much like the Axis powers during your recent world war. Those beings manifested precisely the same behavior as the galactic government that exiled them to external imprisonment on Earth. They were a gruesome reminder of the ageless maxim that an isbe will often manifest the treatment they have received from others. Kindness fosters kindness. Cruelty begets cruelty. One must be able and willing to use force tempered with intelligence to prevent harm to the innocent. However, extraordinary understanding, self-discipline, and courage are required to effectively prevent brutality without being overwhelmed by the malice that motivated the brutality. Only a demonic, self-serving government would employ a logic or science to conceive that an ultimate solution to any problem is to murder and permanently erase the memory of every artist, genius, skilled manager, and inventor, and cast them into a planetary prison, together with political opponents, killers, thieves, perverts, and disabled beings of an entire galaxy. Once the Isbees expelled from the old empire arrived on Earth, they were given amnesia and hypnotically tricked into thinking that something else had happened to them. The next step was to implant the Isbees into biological bodies on Earth. The bodies became the human populations of false civilizations which were designed and installed in the minds of the Isbees to look completely unlike the old empire. All of the Isbees of India, Egypt, Babylon, Greece, Rome, and medieval Europe were guided to a pattern and build the cultural elements of these societies based on standard patterns developed by the Isbees of many earlier similar civilizations on Sun-type 12, Class 7 planets that have existed for trillions of years throughout the universe. In the earliest times, the Isbees sent to prison Earth lived in India. They gradually spread into Mesopotamia, Egypt, Mesoamerica, Archaea, Greece, Rome, medieval Europe, and to the New World. They were hypnotically commanded to follow the pattern of a given civilization by the old empire prison operators. This is an effective mechanism to disguise the actual time and location from the Isbees imprisoned on Earth. The languages, customs, and culture of each false civilization are intended to reinforce amnesia because they do not remind the Isbees on Earth of the original old empire planets from which they were deported. On the very far back track of time, these types of civilizations tended to repeat themselves over and over because the Isbees who created them became familiar with certain patterns and styles and stayed with them. It is a lot of work to invent an entire civilization complete with culture, architecture, language, customs, mathematics, moral values, and so forth. It is much easier to replicate a copy based on a familiar and successful pattern. A Sun-type 12 Class 7 planet is the designation given to a planet inhabited by carbon-oxygen-based life forms. The class of the planet is based on the size and radiation intensity of the star, the distance of the planetary orbit from the star, and the size, density, and gravity, and chemical composition of the planet. Likewise, flora and fauna are designated and identified according to the star type and class of the planet they inhabit. On the average, the percentage of planets in the physical universe with a breathable atmosphere is relatively small. Most planets do not have an atmosphere upon which life forms feed, as on Earth, where the chemical composition of the atmosphere provides nutrition to plants and other organisms which in turn support other life forms. When the domain force brought the Vedic hymns to the Himalayas region, 8200 years ago some human societies already existed. The Aryan people invaded and conquered India, bringing the Vedic hymns to the area. 
The Vedas were learned by them, memorized, and carried forward verbally for 7,000 years before being committed to written form. During that span of time, one of the officers of the Domain Expeditionary Force was incarnated on earth as a Vishnu. He is described many times in the Rig Veda. He is still considered to be a god by the Hindus. Vishnu fought in the religious wars against the old empire forces. He is a very able and aggressive Isbi, as well as a highly effective officer, who has since been reassigned to other duties in the domain. This entire episode was orchestrated as an attack and revolt against the Egyptian pantheon installed by old empire administrators. The conflict was intended to help free humankind from implanted elements of the false civilization that focused attention on many gods and superstitious ritual worship demanded by the priests who managed them. It is all part of the mental manipulation by the old empire to hide their criminal actions against the Isbis on earth. A priesthood, or prison guards, were used to help reinforce the idea that an individual is only a biological body and is not an immortal spiritual being. The individual has no identity. The individuals have no past lives. The individual has no power. Only the gods have power, and the gods are the contrivance of the priests who intercede between men and the gods they serve. Men are slaves to the dictates of the priests who threaten eternal spiritual punishment if men do not obey them. What else would one expect on a prison planet where all the prisoners have amnesia and the priests themselves are prisoners? The intervention of the domain force on earth has not been entirely successful due to the secret mind control operation of the old empire that still continues to operate. A battle was waged between the old empire forces and the domain through religious conquest between 1500 BCE and about 1200 BCE. The domain forces attempted to teach the concept of an individual, immortal spiritual being to several influential beings on earth. One such instance resulted in a very tragic misunderstanding, misinterpretation, and misapplication of the concept. The idea was perverted and applied to mean that there is only one Isbi instead of the truth that everyone is an Isbi. Obviously, this was a gross incomprehension and an utter unwillingness to take responsibility for one's own power. The old empire priests managed to corrupt the concept of the individual immortality into the idea that there is only one all-powerful Isbi, and that no one else is or is allowed to be an Isbi. Obviously, this is the work of the old empire amnesia operation. It is easy to teach this altered notion to beings who do not want to be responsible for their own lives. Slaves are such beings. As long as one chooses to assign responsibility for creation, existence, and personal accountability for one's own thoughts and actions to others, one is a slave. As a result, the concept of a single monotheistic god resulted and was promoted by many self-proclaimed prophets such as the Jewish slave leader Moses, who grew up in the household of the Pharaoh Amenhotep III, and his son Akhenaten, and his wife Nefertiti, as well as his son Tutankhamun. Roswell, Alien Interview, Chapter 9, A Timeline of Events, Matilda O'Donnell McElroy, Personal Note. For this interview, I took written notes because Errol gave me a lot of dates and names that I couldn't possibly remember without writing them down. I didn't usually take notes, but during this lesson, I thought it was important to get the information exactly as she gave it to me. However, I discovered that my note-taking made it much more difficult for me to focus on receiving the communication from Errol. I was sometimes so distracted by my own writing that I lost the train of her thought, so I had to ask her to repeat herself several times. Errol continued to stay in communication with the communications officer on the asteroid belt station, from which she received much of this information. Since Errol was an officer, pilot, and engineer of the domain, and not a historian, she had to get this information from records of reconnaissance missions conducted by other officers of the Domain Expeditionary Force. Official Transcript of Interview, Top Secret The actual history of Earth is very bizarre. 
It's so nonsensical that it is incredible to anyone on earth who attempts to investigate it. A myriad of vital information is missing from it. A huge conglomeration of non sequitur relics and mythology has been arbitrarily introduced into it. The volatile nature of the earth itself cyclically covers, drowns, mixes, and shreds physical evidence. These factors, combined with amnesia, post-hypnotic suggestions, false facades, and cover manipulation make a reconstruction of the factual origins and history of Earth civilizations virtually indecipherable. Any investigator, no matter how brilliant, is doomed to wallow in a quagmire of inconclusive assumptions, unworkable hypothesis, and perpetual mystery. Since the domain does not suffer these afflictions, having the advantage of memory, longevity, and an exterior point of view, I will add some clarification to your fragmentary knowledge of the history of Earth. These are some of the dates and events that are not mentioned in Earth history textbooks. These dates are significant because they provide some information concerning the influences of the old empire and of the domain on Earth. Although I have attended several briefings by our mission control personnel on the general background of the Earth within the past few hundred years, I will rely principally on data gathered from records captured after our invasion of the old Empire Planetary Headquarters. Since that time, the Domain Expeditionary Force has tracked the general progress of events on Earth. As I mentioned, in some cases the Domain has chosen to intervene in certain affairs on Earth in order to ensure the success of our long-term expansion plans. Although the Domain has no interest in Earth per se, or the population of Isbees on this planet, it does serve our interests to ensure that the resources of Earth are not destroyed or spoiled. To that end, certain officers of the Domain have been sent to Earth on reconnaissance missions from time to time to gather information. However, the following dates and events have been extrapolated from the accumulated information in the data files of the Domain, at least those that are accessible to me through the Space Station Communications Center. 208,000 BCE the establishment of the old empire whose headquarters were located near one of the tail stars of the Ursa Major Big Dipper constellation of this galaxy. The old empire invasion force conquered the area with nuclear weapons sometime earlier. After the radioactivity subsided and the cleanup and restoration were completed, it received the immigration of beings from another galaxy into this galaxy. Those beings set up a society that kept going until about 10,000 years ago when it was superseded by the domain. Very recently, Earth civilization has come to resemble aspects of that civilization now that it has fallen out of its immediate control. In particular, the appearance and technology of transportation such as planes, trains, ships, fire engines, and automobiles, as well as what you consider to be modern or futuristic architecture which emulate the design of buildings in the major cities of the old empire. Before 75,000 BCE, the domain records contain very little information about the civilizations on the continental land masses of Atlanta and Lemur, except to note that they did coexist on Earth at more or less the same time. Apparently, both civilizations were founded by remnants of electronic space opera cultures who fled from their native planetary systems to escape political or religious persecution. The Domain knows that a long-standing edict of the old empire prohibits unauthorized colonization of planets. Therefore, it is possible that their destruction was caused by police or military forces who pursued the colonists as criminals and destroyed them. Although this seems a likely supposition, no conclusive evidence exists that explains the complete destruction and disappearance of two entire electronic civilizations. Another possibility is that a massive submarine volcanic eruption in the region of Lake Toba in Sumatra and Mount Krakatoa in Java caused the destruction of Lemur. The floodwaters caused by the eruption overwhelmed all the land masses, including the highest mountains. Survivors of the destruction of the civilization, the Lemurians, are the earliest ancestors of the Chinese. Australia and the ocean areas to the north were the center of the Lemurian civilization and are the source of the oriental races. Both civilizations possessed electronics, flight, and similar technologies of space opera cultures. Apparently the volcanic eruption expelled such a significant mass of molten rock that the resulting vacuum beneath the crust of Earth caused great areas of the land masses to sink below the oceans. 
The continental areas occupied by both civilizations were covered with volcanic matter and then submerged, leaving very little evidence that they ever existed except for legends of a global flood which prevail in every culture of the earth and for survivors who are the genus of the oriental races and cultures. That kind of colossal volcanic explosion fills the stratosphere with toxic gases which are carried around the whole planet. The usual refuse of these volcanic eruptions can easily cause a rain that lasts 40 days and 40 nights due to atmospheric pollution as well as an extensive period during which radiation from the sun is deflected back into space and causes global cooling. Certainly such an event would cause an ice age, extinctions of life forms, and many other relatively long-term changes lasting thousands of years. Due to the myriad types of naturally occurring global cataclysmic events which are indigenous to Earth, it is not a suitable planet for habitation by ISBEs. In addition, there have been occasional global cataclysms caused by ISBEs, such as the one that destroyed the dinosaurs more than 70 million years ago. That destruction was caused by an intergalactic warfare, during which time Earth and many other neighboring moons and planets were bombarded by atomic weapons. Atomic explosions cause atmospheric fallout much like that of volcanic eruptions. Most of the planets in this sector of the galaxy have been uninhabitable deserts since then. Earth is undesirable for many other reasons, heavy gravity and dense atmosphere, floods, earthquakes, volcanoes, polar shifts, continental drift, meteor impacts, atmospheric and climatic changes to name a few. What kind of lasting civilization could any sophisticated culture propose to develop in such an environment? In addition, Earth is a small planet of a rim star of a galaxy. This makes Earth very isolated geographically from the more concentrated planetary civilizations which exist toward the center of the galaxy. These obvious facts have made Earth suitable for use only as a zoological or botanical garden or for its current use as a prison, but not much else. Before 30,000 years BCE, Earth started being used as a dumping ground and prison for Isbees who were judged untouchable, meaning criminal or nonconformists. Isbees were captured, encapsulated in electronic traps, and transported to Earth from various parts of the old empire. Underground amnesia stations were set up on Mars and on Earth in the Renzori Mountains in Africa, in the Pyrenees Mountains of Portugal, and in steppes of Mongolia. These electronic monitoring points create force screens designed to detect and capture ISBEs when the ISBE departs the body at death. ISBEs are brainwashed using extreme electronic force in order to maintain Earth's population in a state of perpetual amnesia. Further population controls are installed through the use of long-range electronic thought control mechanisms. These stations are still in operation, and they are extremely difficult to attack or destroy, even for the domain, which will not maintain a significant military force in this area until a later date. The pyramid civilizations were intentionally created as a part of the ISB prison system on Earth. The pyramid is alleged to be the symbol for wisdom. However, the wisdom of the old empire on planet Earth is intended to operate as part of the elaborate amnesia trap consisting of mass, meaning, and mystery. These are opposite to the qualities of an immortal spiritual being which has no mass or meaning. An isbi is solely because it thinks that it is. Mass represents the physical universe including objects such as stars, planets, gases, liquids, energy particles, and teacups. The pyramids were very, very solid objects, as were all the structures created by the old empire. Heavy, massive, dense, solid objects create the illusion of eternity. Dead bodies wrapped in linen, soaked in resin, placed inside engraved golden coffins, and entombed with earthly possessions amid cryptic symbols create an illusion of eternal life. However, dense, heavy physical universe symbols are the exact opposite of an isbi. An isbi has no mass or time. Objects do not endure forever. An isbi is forever. Meaning... False meanings prevent knowledge of the truth. The pyramid cultures of Earth are a fabricated illusion. They are nothing more than false civilizations contrived by the old empire, mystery cult, called the Brothers of the Serpent.
false meanings were invented to create the illusion of a false society to further reinforce the amnesia mechanism among the inmates in the earth prison system. Mystery is built of lies and half-truths. Lies cause persistence because they alter facts which are comprised of exact dates, places, and events. When truth is known, a lie no longer persists. If the exact truth is revealed, it is no longer a mystery. All of the pyramid civilizations of Earth were carefully contrived of layer upon layer of lies skillfully combined with a few truths. The priest cult of the old empire combined sophisticated mathematics and space opera technology with their theatrical metaphors and symbolism. All of these are complete fabrications of truth baited with the allure of aesthetics and mystery. The intricate rituals, astronomical alignments, secret rites, massive monuments, marvelous architecture, artistically rendered hieroglyphs, and man-animal gods were designed to create an unsolvable mystery for the Isby prison population on Earth. The mystery diverts attention away from the truth that Isbys have been captured, given amnesia, and imprisoned on a planet far, far away from their home. The truth is that every single Isby on Earth came to Earth from some other planetary system. Not one person on Earth is a native inhabitant. Human beings did not evolve on Earth. In the past, Egyptian society was run by the prison administrators or priests, who in turn manipulated a pharaoh, controlled the treasury, and kept the inmate population enslaved physically and spiritually. In modern times, the priests have changed, but the function is the same. However, now the priests are prisoners too. Mystery reinforces the walls of the prison. The old empire feared that the Isbis on earth might regain their memory. Therefore, one of the primary functions of the old empire priesthood is to prevent Isbis on earth from remembering who they really are, how they came to earth, where they came from. The old empire operators of the prison system and their superiors do not want Isbis to remember who murdered them, captured them, stole all of their possessions, sent them to earth, gave them amnesia, and condemned them to eternal imprisonment. Imagine what would happen if all the inmates in the prison suddenly remembered that they have the right to be free. What if they suddenly realize that they have been falsely imprisoned and rise up as one against the guards? They are afraid to reveal anything that looks like the civilization of the inmates' home planets. A body, a piece of clothing, a symbol, a spaceship, an advanced electronics device, or any other remnant of civilization from a home planet could remind a being and rekindle his memory. Sophisticated technologies of entrapment and enslavement, which were developed over millions of years in the old empire, have been applied to the Isbees on Earth with the intention to create a false facade for the prison. These facades were installed on Earth in totality all at once. Every piece is a fully integrated part of the prison system. This includes a religion of mumbo-jumbo doublespeak, Every pyramid civilization uses this as part of a control mechanism to keep the population enslaved by force, by fear, and by ignorance. Roswell, Alien Interview, Chapter 10, A Lesson in Biology, Matilda O'Donnell McElroy, Personal Note. My debrief was also tape recorded as a backup, and to add clarification to the stenographic notes, I debriefed immediately after my interview so that everything that was said was still fresh in my mind. When I recounted these stories to the gallery stenographer, I was still reeling a bit. The perspective on Earth history from the point of view of the domain is very strange, to say the least. I wasn't sure if my uncomfortable feeling came from being disoriented or if it came from being reoriented. Either way, I felt unsteady and confused. Yet at the same time, there was a ring of truth to it. I was elated and incredulous at the same time. The stenographer looked askance at me more than a few times as she recorded the history lesson <laughs> I passed on to her. I'm sure she thought I'd lost my mind. Maybe she was right. 
However, if my mind had been filled with hypnotic suggestions and false memories by the old empire, as Errol suggested, perhaps losing my mind would be a good idea. I didn't have much time to ponder my personal thoughts about these things at the time. It was my duty to get all the information I could from Errol and pass it on to the stenographer as soon as Errol was finished. My job was not to analyze the information, just report it as accurately as possible. The analysis would be left to the men in the gallery, or whomever else was receiving copies of the transcripts. I also delivered a list of books and materials requested by Errol to the agent in the gallery room so these could be gathered and delivered to Errol. Each night after I left Errol, she spent the rest of the night reading or scanning the materials which had been delivered to her. The members of the gallery each received a transcript of the stenographic dictation to study, each looking for information that was of interest to them. In the morning after breakfast, I reported back to the interview room to continue my interviews or lessons with Errol. Official transcript of interview, top secret, official transcript of the U.S. Army Air Force, Roswell Army Airfield, 509th Bomb Group, subject alien interview, July 28, 1947, first session. The origins of this universe and life on Earth, as discussed in the textbooks I have read, are very inaccurate. Since you serve your government as a medical personnel, your duties require that you understand biological entities, so I am sure that you will appreciate the value of the material I will share with you today. The texts of books I have been given on the subjects related to the function of life forms contain information that is based on false memories, inaccurate observation, missing data, unproven theories, and superstition. Whew. For example, just a few hundred years ago, your physicians practiced bloodletting as a means to release supposed ill humors from the body in an attempt to relieve or heal a wide variety of physical and mental afflictions. Although this has been corrected somewhat, many barbarisms are still being practiced in the name of medical science. In addition to the application of incorrect theories concerning biological engineering, Many primary errors that earth scientists make are the result of an ignorance of the nature and relative importance of ISBEs as the source of energy and intelligence which animate every life form. Although it is not a priority of the domain to intervene in the affairs of Earth, the Domain Communications Office has authorized me to provide you with some information in an effort to provide more accurate and complete understanding of these things and thereby enable you to discover more effective solutions to the unique problems you face on Earth. The correct information about the origins of biological entities has been erased from your mind as well as from the minds of your mentors. In order to help you regain your own memory, I will share with you some factual material concerning the origin of biological entities. I asked Errol if she was referring to the subject of evolution. Errol said, no, not exactly. You will find evolution mentioned in the ancient Vedic hymns. The Vedic texts are like folk tales or common wisdoms and superstitions gathered throughout the systems of the domain. These were compiled into verses like a book of rhymes. For every statement of truth, the verses contain many half-truths, reversals of truth, and fanciful imaginings blended without qualification or distinction. The theory of evolution assumes that the motivational source of energy that animates every life form does not exist. It assumes that an inanimate object or chemical concoction can suddenly become alive or animate accidentally or spontaneously, or perhaps an electrical discharge into a pool of chemical ooze will magically spawn a self-animated entity. There is no evidence whatsoever that this is true, simply because it's not true. Dr. Frankenstein did not really resurrect the dead into a marauding monster, except in the imagination of the Isbees, who wrote a fictitious story one dark and stormy night. <clears throat> no Western scientist ever stopped to consider who, what, where, when, or how this animation happens. Complete ignorance, denial, or unawareness of the spirit as the source of life force required to animate inanimate objects or cellular tissue is the sole cause of failures in Western medicine. In addition, evolution does not occur accidentally. It requires a great deal of technology, which must be manipulated under the careful supervision of ISBEs. 
Very simple examples are seen in the modification of farm animals or in the breeding of dogs. However, the notion that human biological organisms evolved naturally from earlier ape-like forms is incorrect. No physical evidence will ever be uncovered to substantiate the notion that modern humanoid bodies evolved on this planet. The reason is simple. The idea that human bodies evolved spontaneously from the primordial ooze of chemical interactivity in the dim mists of time is nothing more than a hypnotic lie instilled in the amnesia operation to prevent your recollection of the true origins of mankind. Factually, humanoid bodies have existed in various forms throughout the universe for trillions of years. This was compounded by the fact that the Vedic hymns were brought to earth 8,200 years ago by the Domain Expeditionary Force. While they were based in the Himalaya Mountains, the verses were taught to some of the local humans who memorized them. However, I should note that this was not an authorized activity for the crew of the Domain installation, although I am sure it seemed like an innocent diversion for them at the time. The verses were passed along verbally from one generation to the next for thousands of years in the foothills and eventually spread throughout India. No one in the domain credits any of the material in the Vedic hymns as factual material any more than you would use Grimm's fairy tales as a guide for rearing children. However, on a planet where all of the Isbees have had their memory erased, one can understand how these tales and fantasies could be taken seriously. Unfortunately, the humans who learned the Vedic verses passed them along to others saying that they came from the gods. Eventually, the content of the verses were adopted verbatim as truth. The euphemistic and metaphorical content of the Veda were accepted and practiced as dogmatic fact. The philosophy of the verses were ignored, and the verses became the genesis of nearly every religion practice on the planet except Hinduism. As an officer, pilot, and engineer of the domain, I must always assume a very pragmatic point of view. I could not be effective or accomplish my missions if I were to use philosophical dogma or rhetoric as my operations manual. Therefore, our discussion of history is based on actual events that occurred long before any Isbees arrived on earth and long before the old empire came into power. I can relate part of this history from my personal experience. Many billions of years ago, I was a member of a very large biological laboratory in a galaxy far from this one. It was called the Arcadia Regeneration Company. I was a biological engineer working with a large staff of technicians. It was our business to manufacture and supply new life forms to uninhabited planets. There were millions of star systems with millions of uninhabited planets in the region at that time. There were many other biological laboratory companies at that time also. Each of them specialized in producing different kinds of life forms depending on the class of the planet being populated. Over a long span of time, these laboratories developed a vast catalog of species throughout the galaxies. The majority of the basic genetic material is common to all species of life. Therefore, most of their work was concerned with manipulating alterations of the basic genetic pattern to produce variations of life forms that would be suitable inhabitants for various planetary classes. The Arcadia Regeneration Company specialized in mammals for forested areas and birds for tropical regions. Our marketing staff negotiated contracts with various planetary governments and independent buyers from all over the universe. The technicians created animals that were compatible with the variations in the climate, atmospheric and terrestrial density, and chemical content. In addition, they were paid to integrate our specimens with biological organisms engineered by other companies already living on a planet. In order to do this, our staff was in communication with other companies who created life forms. There were industry trade shows, publications, and a variety of other information supplied through an association that coordinated related projects. As you can imagine, our research required a great deal of interstellar travel to conduct planetary surveys. This is when I learned my skills as a pilot. The data gathered was accumulated in huge computer databases and evaluated by biological engineers. A computer is an electronic device that serves as an artificial brain or complex calculating machine. It is capable of storing information, making computations, solving problems, and performing mechanical functions. 1947. (laughs) 
In most of the galactic systems of the universe, very large computers are commonly used to run the routine administration, mechanical services, and maintenance activities of the entire planet or planetary system. Based on the survey data gathered, designs and artistic renderings were made for new creatures. Some designs were sold to the highest bidder. Other life forms were created to meet the customized requests of our clients. The design and technical specifications were passed along an assembly line through a series of cellular, chemical, and mechanical engineers to solve the various problems. It was their job to integrate all the component factors into a workable, functional, and aesthetic finished product. Prototypes of these creatures were then produced and tested in artificially created environments. Imperfections were worked out, modifications made, and eventually a new life form was endowed or animated with a life force or spiritual energy before being introduced into the actual planetary environment for final testing. After a new life form was introduced, we monitored the interaction of these biological organisms with the planetary environment and with other indigenous life forms. Conflicts resulting from from the interaction between incompatible organisms were resolved through negotiation between ourselves and other companies. The negotiations usually resulted in compromises requiring further modification to our creatures or to theirs or both. This is a part of science or art you call eugenics. In some cases, changes were made in a planetary environment, but not often, as planet building is much more complex than making changes to an individual life form. Coincidentally, a friend and engineer with whom I used to work with at the Arcadia Regeneration Company a long time after I left the company told me that one of the projects they contracted to do in more recent times was to deliver life forms to Earth to replenish them after a war in this region of the galaxy devastated most of the life on the planets in this region of space. This would have been about 70 million years ago. The skill required to modify the planet into an ecologically interactive environment that will support billions of diverse species was an immense undertaking. Specialized consultants from nearly every biotechnology company in the galaxy were brought in to help with the project. What you now see on Earth is the huge variety of life forms left behind. Your scientists believe that the fallacious theory of evolution is an explanation for the existence of all life forms here. The truth is that all life forms on this and any other planet in this universe were created by companies like ours. How else can you explain the millions of completely divergent and unrelated species of life on land and in the oceans of this planet? How else can you explain the source of spiritual animation which defines every living creature? To say it is the work of God is far too broad. Every Isby has many names and faces in many times and places. Every Isby is a God. When they inhabit a physical object, they are the source of life. For example, there are millions of species of insects. About 350,000 of these are species of beetles. There may be as many as 100 million species of life forms on Earth at any given time. In addition, there are many times more extinct species of life on Earth than there are living life forms. Some of these will be rediscovered in the fossil or geological records of Earth. The current theory of evolution of life forms on Earth does not consider the phenomena of biological diversity. Evolution by natural selection is science fiction. One species does not accidentally or randomly evolve to become another species, as the Earth textbooks indicate, without manipulation of genetic material by an ISBE. A simple example of ISBE intervention is the selective breeding of a species on Earth. Roswell, Alien Interview, Chapter 11, A Lesson in Science, Matilda O'Donnell McElroy, Personal Note. The transcript of this interview is verbatim. There is nothing more I can add to it. It says everything. Official transcript of interview, top secret. Official transcript of the U.S. Army Air Force, Roswell Army Airfield, 509th Bomb Group. Subject, Alien Interview, July 29, 1947, First Session. Today, Errol told me some very technical things. Things. I took a few notes to remind myself so I can repeat what she said as closely as possible. She began with an analogy about scientific knowledge. Can you imagine how much progress could have been made on Earth if people like Johannes Gutenberg, Sir Isaac Newton, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington Carver, Nikola Tesla, Jonas Salk, and Richard Trevithick, 
and many thousands of similar geniuses and inventors were living today. Imagine what technical accomplishments might have been developed if men like these never died. What if they were never given amnesia and made to forget everything they knew? What if they continued to learn and work forever? What level of technology and civilization could be attained if immortal spiritual beings like these were allowed to continue to create in the same place at the same time for billions or trillions of years? Essentially, the domain is one civilization that has existed for trillions of years with relatively uninterrupted progress. Knowledge has been accumulated, refined, and improved upon in nearly every field of study imaginable and beyond imagining. Originally, the interaction of ISBE illusions or inventions created the very fabric of the physical universe, the microcosm, and the macrocosm. Originally, the interaction of ISBE illusions or inventions created the very fabric of the physical universe, the microcosm, and the macrocosm. Every single particle of the universe has been imagined and brought into existence by an ISBE. Everything created from an idea, a thought, with no weight or size or location in space. Every speck of dust in space from the size of the tiniest subatomic particle to the size of a sun or Magellanic to the size of a sun or a Magellanic cloud, the size of many galaxies, was created from the nothingness of a thought. Even the tiniest individual cells were contrived and coordinated to enable a microbial entity to sense and navigate through infinitesimally small spaces. These also came from an idea thought up by an ISBE. You and every ISBE on Earth have participated in the creation of this universe, even though you are now confined to a fragile body made of flesh. You live only 65 short rotations of your planet around a star. You have been given overwhelming electric shock treatments to wipe out your memory. You must learn everything all over again each lifetime in spite of all these circumstances. You are who you are and will always be. And deep down you still know that you are and what you know. You are still the essence of you. How else could anyone understand the child prodigy? An Isby who plays concertos on a piano at three years of age without formal training? Impossible if they do not simply remember what they have already learned from thousands of lives spent in front of a keyboard in times untold or on planets far away. They may not know how they know, they just know. Humankind has developed more technology in the past 100 years than in the past 2,000 years. Why? The answer is simple. The influence of the old empire over the mind and over the affairs of mankind has been diminished by the domain. A renaissance of invention of Earth began in 1250 A.D. with the destruction of the old empire space fleet in the solar system. During the next 500 years, Earth may have the potential to regain autonomy and independence, but only to the degree that humankind can apply the concentrated genius of the Isbees on Earth to solve the amnesia problem. However, on a cautionary note, the inventive potential of the Isbees who have been exiled to this planet is severely compromised by the criminal element of the Earth population, specifically politicians, warmongers, and irresponsible physicists who create unlimited weapons such as nuclear bombs, chemicals, disease, and social chaos. These have the potential to extinguish all life forms on Earth forever. Even the relatively small explosions that were tested and used in the past two years on Earth have the potential to destroy all life if deployed in sufficient quantity. Larger weapons could consume all the oxygen in the global atmosphere in a single explosion. Therefore, the most fundamental problems that must be solved in order to ensure that Earth will not be destroyed by technology are social and humanitarian problems. The greatest scientific minds of Earth, in spite of mathematical or mechanical genius, have never addressed these problems. Therefore, do not look to scientists to save Earth or the future of humanity. Any so-called science that is solely based on the paradigm that existence is composed of energy and objects moving through space is not a science. Such beings utterly ignore the creative spark originated by an individual ISBE and collective work of the ISBEs who continually create physical universe and all universes. Every science will remain relatively ineffective or destructive to the degree that it omits or devaluates the relative importance of the spiritual spark that ignites all creation and life.
Unfortunately, this ignorance has been carefully and forcefully instilled in human beings by the old empire to ensure that Isbees on this planet will not be able to recover their innate ability to create space, energy, matter, and time, or any other component part of universes. As long as awareness of the immortal, powerful, spiritual self is ignored, humanity will remain imprisoned until the day of its own self-destruction and oblivion. Do not rely on the dogma of physical sciences to master the fundamental forces of creation any more than you would trust the chanted incantations of an incense-burning shaman. The next result of both of these is entrapment and oblivion. Scientists pretend to observe, but they only suppose what they see and call it fact. Like the blind man, a scientist cannot learn to see until he realizes that he's blind. The facts of earth science do not include the source of creation. They include only the result or byproducts of creation. The facts of science do not include any memory of the nearly infinite past experience of existence. The essence of creation and existence cannot be found through the lens of a microscope or telescope or by any other measurement of the physical universe. One cannot comprehend the perfume of a flower or the pain felt by an abandoned lover with meters and calipers. Everything you will ever know about the creative force and ability of a god can be found within you, an immortal spiritual being. How can a blind man teach others to see the nearly infinite gradients that comprise the spectrum of light? The notion that one can understand the universe without understanding the nature of an isbe is as absurd as conceiving that an artist is a speck of paint on his own canvas, or that the lace on a ballet shoe is the choreographer's vision, or the grace of a dancer, or the electric excitement of opening night. Study of the spirit has been booby-trapped by the thought control operation through religious superstitions they instill in the minds of men. Conversely, the study of the spirit and the mind have been prohibited by science, which eliminates anything that is not measurable in the physical universe. Science is the religion of matter. It worships matter. The paradigm of science is that creation is all and the creator is nothing. Religion says the creator is all and the creation is nothing. These two extremes are the bars of a prison cell. They prevent observation of all phenomena as an interactive whole. Study of creation without knowing the isbe, the source of creation, is futile. When you sail to the edge of a universe conceived by science, you fall off the end into an abyss of dark, dispassionate space and lifeless, unrelenting force. On earth you have been convinced that the oceans of the mind and spirit are filled with gruesome, ghoulish monsters that will eat you alive if you dare to venture beyond the breakwater of superstition. The vested interest of the old empire prison system is to prevent you from looking at your own soul. They fear that you will see in your own memory the slave masters who kept you imprisoned. The prison is made of shadows in your mind. The shadows are made of lies and pain and loss and fear. The true geniuses of civilization are those isbees who will enable other isbees to recover their memory and regain self-realization and self-determination. This issue is not solved through enforcing moral regulation on behavior or through the control of beings through mystery faith, drugs, guns, or other dogma of a slave society, and certainly not through the use of electric shock and hypnotic commands. The survival of earth and every being on it depends on the ability to recover the memory of skills you have accrued through the trilenia to recover the essence of yourself. Such an art, science, or technology has never been conceived in the old empire. Otherwise, they would not have restored to the solution that brought you to your current conditions on earth. Neither has such technology ever been developed by the domain. Until recently, the necessity of rehabilitating an isbe with amnesia has not been needed. Therefore, no one has ever worked on solving this problem. So far, unfortunately, the domain has no solution to offer. A few officers of the Domain Expeditionary Force have taken it upon themselves to provide technology to Earth during their off-duty time. 
these officers leave their doll at the space station and as an ISB assume or take over a biological body on Earth. In some cases, an officer can remain on duty while they inhabit and control other bodies at the same time. This is a very dangerous and adventurous undertaking. It requires a very able ISB to accomplish such a mission and return to the base successfully. One officer who did this recently while continuing to attend his official duties was known on Earth as the electronics inventor Nikola Tesla. It is my intention, although is not a part of my mission orders, to assist you in your efforts to advance scientific and humanitarian progress on Earth. My intention is to help other ISBs to help themselves. In order to solve the amnesia problem on Earth, you will need much more advanced technology, as well as social stability to allow enough time for research, and need much more advanced technology as well as social stability to allow enough time for research and development of techniques to free the ISB from the body and to free the mind of the ISB from amnesia. Although the domain has a long-term interest in maintaining Earth as a useful planet, it has no particular interest in the human population of Earth other than its own personnel here. We are interested in preventing the destruction as well as accelerating the development of technologies that will sustain the infrastructures of the global biosphere, hydrosphere, and atmosphere. To this end, you will discover on very careful and thorough examination that my spacecraft contains a wide assortment of technology that does not exist on your Earth. If you distribute pieces of this craft to various scientists for study, they will be able to reverse engineer some of the technology to the extent that Earth has the raw materials required to replicate these components. Some features will be indecipherable. Other features cannot be duplicated as Earth does not have the natural resources required to replicate them. This is especially true of the metals used to construct the craft. Not only do these metals not exist on Earth, the refining process required to produce these metals took billions of years to develop. It is also true of the navigation system which requires an ISB whose own personal wavelength has been specifically attuned to the neural network of the craft. The pilot of the craft must possess a very high order of energy, volition, discipline, training, and intelligence to manipulate such a craft. ISBs on Earth are incapable of this expertise because it requires the use of an artificial body specifically created for this purpose. Certain individual Earth scientists, some of whom are among the most brilliant minds in the history of the universe, will have their memory of this technology jogged when they examine the craft components, just as some of the scientists and physicists on Earth have been able to remember how to recreate electronic generators, internal combustion, and steam locomotion, refrigeration, aircraft, antibiotics, and other tools of your civilization, they will also rediscover other vital technology in my craft. The following are the specific systems embodied in my craft that contain useful components. There is an assortment of microscopic wiring or fibers within the walls of the craft that control such things as communications, information storage, computer function, and automatic navigation. The same wiring is used for light, sublight, and ultralight spectrum detection and vision. The fabrics of the interior of the craft are far superior to any on Earth at this time and have hundreds of thousands of applications. You will also find mechanisms for creating, amplifying, and channeling light particles or waves as a form of energy. As an officer, pilot, and engineer of the domain forces, I am not at liberty to discuss or convey the detailed operation or construction of the craft in any way other than what I have just disclosed. However, I am confident that there are many competent engineers on Earth who will develop useful technology with these resources. I am providing these details to you in the hope that the greater good of the domain will be served. Roswell, Alien Interview, Chapter 12, A Lesson in Immortality. Matilda O'Donnell McElroy, Personal Note. I think the following transcript is pretty much self-explanatory. Official transcript of interview, top secret. Official transcript of the U.S. Army Air Force, Russell Army Airfield, 509th Bomb Group. Subject, alien interview, 
July 30, 1947, First Session. Immortal spiritual beings, which I refer to as isbes for the sake of convenience, are the source and creators of illusions. Each one individually and collectively, in their original unfettered state of being, are an eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing entity. Isbees create space by imagining a location. The intervening distance between themselves and the imagined location is what we call space. An isbe can perceive the space and objects created by other isbees. Isbees are not physical universe entities. They are a source of energy and illusion. Isbees are not located in space or time, but can create space, place particles in space, create energy, and shape particles into various forms, cause the motion of forms, and animate forms. Any form which is animated by an isbe is called life. An isbe can decide to agree that they are located in space or time, and that they themselves are an object, or any other manner of illusion created by themselves, or another, or other isbes. The disadvantages of creating an illusion is that an illusion must be continually created. If not continually created, it disappears. Continual creation of an illusion requires incessant attention to every detail of the illusion in order to sustain it. A common denominator of isbees seems to be the desire to avoid boredom. A spirit only, without interaction with other isbees, and the unpredictable motion, drama, and unanticipated intentions and illusions being created by other isbees is easily bored. What if you could imagine anything, perceive everything, and cause anything to happen at will? What if you couldn't do anything else? What if you always knew the outcome of every game and the answer to every question? Would you get bored? The entire back time track of isbees is immeasurable, nearly infinite, in terms of physical universe time. There is no measurable beginning or end for an isbe. They simply exist in an everlasting now. Another common denominator of isbees is that admiration of one's own illusions by others is very desirable. If the desired admiration is not forthcoming, the isbe will keep creating the illusion in an attempt to get admiration. One could say that the entire physical universe is made of unadmired illusions. The origins of this universe began with the creation of individual illusionary spaces. These were the home of the isbes. Sometimes a universe is a collaborative creation of illusions by two or more isbes. A proliferation of isbes in the universe they create sometimes collide or become commingled or merge to an extent that many isbes shared in the co-creation of a universe. Isbes diminish their ability in order to have a game to play. Isbes think that any game is better than no game. They will endure pain, suffering, stupidity, privation, and all manner of unnecessary and undesirable conditions just to play a game. Pretending that one does not know all, see all, and cause all is a way to create the conditions necessary for playing a game. Unknowns, freedoms, barriers, and or opponents and goals. Ultimately, playing a game solves the problem of boredom. In this fashion, all the space, galaxy, suns, planets, and physical phenomena of this universe including life forms, places, and events that have been created by isbes and sustained by mutual agreement that these things exist. There are as many universes as there are isbes to imagine, build, and perceive them, each existing concurrently with its own continuum. Each universe is created using its own unique set of rules as imagined, altered, preserved, or destroyed by one or more isbes who created it. Time, energy, objects, and space, as defined in terms of the physical universe, may or may not exist in other universes. The domain exists in such a universe, as well as in the physical universe. One of the rules of the physical universe is that energy can be created but not destroyed. So the universe will keep expanding as long as isbes keep adding more new energy to it. It's nearly infinite. It is like an automobile assembly line that never stops running and none of the cars are ever destroyed. 
Every ISBE is basically good, therefore an ISBE does not enjoy doing things to other ISBEs which they themselves do not want to experience. For an ISBE, there is no inherent standard for what is good or bad, right or wrong, ugly or beautiful. These ideas are all based on the opinion of each individual ISBE. The closest concept that human beings have to describe an ISBE is as a god, all-knowing, all-powerful, infinite. So how does a god stop being a god? They pretend not to know. How can you play a game of hide-and-seek if you always know where the other person is hiding? You pretend not to know where the other players are hiding, so you can go off and seek them. This is how games are created. You have forgotten that you are just pretending. In so doing, Isbees become entrapped and enslaved inside a maze of their own devising. How does one create a cage, lock one's own self inside the cage, throw away the key, and forget there is a key or cage, and forget there is an inside or outside, and even forget that there is a self? Create the illusion that there is no illusion, the entire universe is real, and that no other universe exists or can be created. On earth, the propaganda taught and agreed upon is that the gods are responsible and that human beings are not responsible. You are taught that only God can create universes. So the responsibility for every action is assigned to another isbi or God, never oneself. No human being ever assumes personal responsibility for the fact that they themselves, individually and collectively, are gods. This fact alone is the source of entrapment for every isbi. Roswell, Alien Interview, Chapter 13, A Lesson in the Future, Matilda O'Donnell McElroy, Personal Note. I think this transcript speaks for itself also. I relayed Errol's exact communication as faithfully as possible. My superior officers became very alarmed about the possible military implications of what Errol said in this interview. Official transcript of interview, top secret. Official transcript of the U.S. Army Air Force. Roswell Army Airfield, 509th Bomb Group. Subject, Alien Interview, July 31, 1947, First Session. It is my personal belief that the truth should not be sacrificed on the altar of political, religious, or economic expediency. As an officer, pilot, and engineer of the domain, it is my duty to protect the greater good of the domain and its possessions. However, we cannot defend ourselves against forces of which we are not aware. The isolation of Earth from the rest of civilization prevents me from discussing many subjects with you at this time. Security and protocol prevent me from revealing any but the broadest general statements about the plans and activities of the domain. However, I can give you some information that you might find useful. I must return to my assigned duties on the space station now. I have provided as much help as I feel ethically able to offer, given the requirements and constraints of my duties as an officer, pilot, and engineer of the domain forces. Therefore, I will depart as an ISBE from Earth within the next 24 hours. Editor's note, the following several paragraphs appear to be personal comments made by Matilda to the stenographer regarding her interview with Errol. What this means is that Errol will leave her doll with us as her craft is damaged beyond repair. We can examine, dissect, and study the body at our leisure. She does not have any further use for it, nor does she have any personal feelings or attachments to it, as others are readily available for her to use. Errol does not recommend that there are any technology in the body that Earth scientists will find useful, however. The technology of the body is simple, yet vastly beyond the reckoning of our current ability to analyze or reverse engineer any facet of it. The body is neither biological or mechanical, but a unique fabrication of materials and ancient technologies not found on any Earth-type planet. As Errol mentioned previously, a very rigid and distinctive hierarchy of social, economic, and cultural classes exists throughout the domain, which has remained unvaried and inviolate for many millennia. The body type and function assigned to an SB officer vary specifically according to the rank, class, longevity, training level, command level, service record, and meritorious citations earned by each individual ISB, as with any other military insignia. The body used by Earl is specifically designed for an officer, pilot, and engineer of her rank and class. 
The bodies of her companions, which were destroyed in the crash, were not the same rank or class, but of a junior rank. Therefore, the appearance, features, composition, and functionality of those bodies were specialized and limited to the requirements of their duties. The junior officers whose bodies were damaged in the crash have left their bodies and returned to their duties in the space station. The damage suffered by their bodies was due primarily to the fact that they were officers of lower rank. They used bodies which were partially biological and therefore far less durable and resilient than hers. Editor's note, at this point the transcript appears to resume with statements made by Errol. Although the domain will not hesitate to destroy any active vestiges of the old empire operations wherever they are discovered, this is not our primary mission in this galaxy. I'm sure that the old empire mind control mechanisms can be deactivated and destroyed eventually. However, it is not possible to estimate how long this may take, as we do not understand the extent of this operation at this time. We do know that the old empire force screen is vast enough to cover this end of the galaxy at least. We also know from experience that each force generator and trapping device is very difficult to detect, locate, and destroy. Also, it is not the current mission of the Domain Expeditionary Force to commit resources to this endeavor. The eventual destruction of these devices may make it possible for your memory to be restored simply by virtue of not having it erased after each lifetime. Fortunately, the memory of an ISBI cannot be permanently erased. There are many other active space civilizations who maintain various nefarious operations in this area, not the least of which is dumping unwanted ISBIs on Earth. None of these craft are hostile or in violent opposition to the domain forces. They know better than to challenge us. For the most part, the domain ignores Earth and its inhabitants, except to ensure that the resources of the planet itself are not permanently spoiled. This sector of the galaxy was annexed by the domain and is the possession of the domain to do with or dispose of it as deems best. The moon of Earth and the asteroid belt have become a permanent base of operations for the domain forces. Needless to say, any attempt by humans or others to interfere in the activities of the domain in this solar system, even if it were possible, which it definitely is not, will be terminated swiftly. This is not a serious concern, as I mentioned earlier, since Homo sapiens cannot operate in open space. Of course, we will continue with the next steps of the domain expansion plan, which has remained on schedule for billions of years. Over the next 5,000 years, there will be increasing traffic and activity of the domain forces as we progress toward the center of this galaxy and beyond to spread our civilization through the universe. If humanity is to survive, it must cooperate to find effective solutions to the difficult conditions of your existence on Earth. Humanity must rise above its human form and discover where they are and that they are Isbees and who they really are as Isbees in order to transcend the notion that they are merely biological bodies. Once these realizations have been made, it may be possible to escape your current imprisonment. Otherwise, there will be no future for the Isbees on Earth. Although there are no active battles or wars being waged between the Domain and the Old Empire, there still exists the covert actions of the Old Empire taken against Earth through their thought control operation. When one knows that these activities exist, the effects can be observed clearly. The most obvious examples of these actions against the human race can be seen as incidents of sudden, inexplicable behavior. A very recent instance of this occurred in the United States military just before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Just three days before the attack, someone in authority ordered all the ships in Pearl Harbor to go into port and secure for inspection. The ships were ordered to take all the ammunition out of their magazines and store it below. On the afternoon before the attack, all of the admirals and generals were attending parties, even though two Japanese aircraft carriers were discovered standing right off Pearl Harbor. The obvious action to take would have been to contact Pearl Harbor by telephone to warn them of the danger of a fight starting and to put the ammunition back and order the ships to get out of port into the open sea. About six hours before the Japanese attack began, a U.S. Navy ship sank a small Japanese submarine right outside the harbor. 
Instead of contacting Pearl Harbor by telephone to report the incident, a warning message was put into top-secret code, which took about two hours to encode. Then it took another two hours to decode. The word of warning to Pearl Harbor did not arrive until 10 a.m. Pearl Harbor time Sunday, two hours after the Japanese attack destroyed the U.S. fleet. How do things like this happen? If the men who were responsible for these obviously disastrous errors were stood up and asked bluntly to justify their actions and intentions, we would find out that they were quite sincere in their jobs. Ordinarily, they do the very best they can do for people and nations. However, all of a sudden, from some completely unknown and undetectable source, enters these wild, unexplainable situations that just can't exist. The old empire thought control operation is run by a small group of old baboons with very small minds. They are playing insidious games with no purpose and no goal other than to control and destroy Isbees who could otherwise manage themselves perfectly well if left alone. These types of artificially created incidents are being forced upon the human race by the operations of the mind control prison system. The prison guards will always promote and support oppressive and totalitarian activities of ISBEs on Earth. Why not keep the inmates fighting between themselves? Why not empower madmen to run the governments of Earth? The men who run the criminal governments of Earth mirror the commands given them by covert thought controllers of the old empire. The human race will continue to shadow box with this for a long time, as long as it remains the human race. Until then, the Isbees on Earth will continue to live a series of consecutive lives over and over and over. The same Isbee who lived during the rise and fall of civilizations in India, China, Mesopotamia, Greece, and Rome are inhabiting bodies in the present time in America, France, Russia, Africa, and around the world. In between each lifetime, an Isbee is sent back again to begin all over, as though the new life was the only life they had ever lived. They begin anew in pain, in misery, and mystery. Some Isbees have been transported to Earth more recently than others. Some Isbees have been on Earth only a few hundred years, so they have no personal experience with the earlier civilizations of Earth. They have no experiences of having lived on Earth so could not remember a previous existence here, even if their memory was restored. They might, however, remember lives they lived elsewhere, on other planets, and in other times. Others have been here since the first days of Lemuria. In any case, the Isbees of Earth are here forever until they can break the amnesia cycle, conquer the electronic traps set up by their captors, and free themselves. Because the Domain has 3,000 of their own Isbees in captivity on Earth also, they have an interest in solving this problem. This problem has never been encountered or effectively solved before in the universe as far as they know. They will continue their efforts to free those Isbees from Earth where and when it is possible, but it will require time to develop an unprecedented technology and the diligence to do so. Editor's note, the following statement is a comment by Matilda. I think that it is Errol's sincere desire, as one is be to another, that the rest of our eternity will be as pleasant as possible. Roswell Alien Interview, Chapter 14, Errol Reviews the Interview Transcripts, Matilda O'Donnell McElroy, Personal Note. Shortly after I finished recounting the previous interview with Errol to the stenographer, I was summoned urgently to the office of the commanding officer of the base. I was escorted by four heavily armed military policemen. When I arrived, I was asked to be seated in a very large makeshift office that had been arranged with a conference table and chairs. In the office were several dignitaries I had seen at various times in the gallery. I recognized a few of them because they were famous men. I was introduced to these men, which included Army Air Force Secretary Symington, General Nathan Twining, General Jimmy Doolittle, General Vandenberg, and General Northstadt. To my surprise, Charles Lindbergh was also in the office. Secretary Symington explained to me that Mr. Lindbergh was there as a consultant to the Chief of Staff of the U.S. Air Force. 
There were several other men present in the room who were not introduced. I assume these men were personal aides to the officers or agents of some intelligence service. All of this sudden attention, not only from the secretary and generals, but from world-famous people as Mr. Lindbergh and Mr. Doolittle, made me realize how critically important my role as an interpreter for Errol was, as seen through the eyes of others. Until this time, I was not really aware of this except in a peripheral sense. I suppose this was because I was so absorbed in details of the extraordinary situation. Suddenly, I began to grasp the magnitude of my role. I think that the presence of these men in that meeting was intended, in part, to impress me with this fact. The secretary instructed me not to be nervous. He said that I was not in any trouble. He asked me if I thought the alien would be willing to answer a list of questions they had prepared. He explained that they were very eager to discover many more details about Errol, the flying disc, the domain, and many other subjects that Errol had disclosed in the interview transcripts. Of course, they were mainly interested in questions relating to the military security and the construction of the flying disc. I told them that I was very sure that Errol had not changed her mind about answering questions, as nothing had changed that would cause her to trust the intentions of the men in the gallery. I repeated that Errol had communicated everything that she was willing and at liberty to discuss already. In spite of this, they insisted that I would ask Errol again if she would answer questions, and the answer was still no. I was to ask her if she would be willing to read the written copies of the transcripts of my interview translations. They wanted to know if Errol would verify that my understanding and translation of our interviews was correct. Since Errol could not read English very fluently, the secretary asked if they could be allowed to observe for themselves while Errol read the transcripts and verify that they were correct in writing. They wanted her to write a copy of the transcripts, whether the translation were correct or not, and make a note of anything that was not accurate in the transcripts. Of course, I had no choice but to obey orders, and I did exactly what the secretary requested. I was given a copy of the transcripts with a signature page, which I was to show to Errol. After Errol completed her review, I was also directed to request that Errol sign the cover page, attesting that all the translations in the transcripts were correct, as amended by her. About an hour later, I entered the interview room, as instructed, with copies of the transcripts and signature page to deliver to Errol, as the members of the gallery, including the generals, and Mr. Lindbergh also, I presume, and others watched through the glass of the gallery room. I went to my usual seat, sitting four or five feet across from Errol. I presented the envelope of transcripts to Errol and passed on the instructions I had received from the secretary telepathically. Errol looked at me and looked at the envelope without accepting it. Errol said, If you have read them and they are accurate in your own estimation, there is no need for me to review them also. The translations are correct. You can tell your commander that you have faithfully conveyed a record of our communication. I assured Errol that I had read them, and they were exact recordings of everything I told the transcription typist. Will you sign the page then, I asked. No, I will not, said Errol. May I ask you why not, I said. I was a little confused as to why she wasn't willing to do such a simple thing. If your commander does not trust his own staff to make an honest and accurate report to him, what confidence will my signature on the page give him? Why will he trust an ink mark on a page made by an officer of the domain if he does not trust his own loyal staff? I didn't quite know what to say to that. I couldn't argue with Arl's logic, and I couldn't force her to sign the document either. I sat in my chair for a minute, wondering what to do next. I thanked Errol and told her I needed to go ask my superiors for further instructions. I placed the envelope of the transcripts in the inside breast pocket of my uniform jacket, and I began to rise from my chair. At that moment, the door from the gallery room slammed open. Five heavily armed military police rushed into the room. A man in a white laboratory coat followed closely behind them. He pushed a small cart that carried a box-shaped machine with a lot of dials on the face of it. Before I could act, two of the MPs grabbed Errol and held her firmly down on the oversized chair she had been sitting on since the first day of our interviews together. The other two MPs grabbed my shoulders and pushed me back down on my chair and held me there. The other MP stood directly in front of Errol, pointing a rifle directly at her, no more than six inches from her head. The man in the lab coat quickly wheeled the cart behind Errol's chair. He deftly placed a circular headband over Errol's head and turned back to the machine on the cart. 
Suddenly, he shouted the word, Clear! The soldiers who were holding Errol released her. At that instant, I saw Errol's body stiffen and shudder. This lasted for about 15 or 20 seconds. The machine operator turned a knob on the machine, and Errol's body slumped back into the chair. After a few seconds, he turned the knob again, and Errol's body stiffened as before. He repeated the same process several more times. I sat in my chair being held down all the while by the MPs, and I didn't understand what was going on. I was terrified and transfixed by what was happening. I couldn't believe it. After a few minutes, several other men wearing white lab coats entered the room. They briefly examined Errol, who was now slumped listlessly in the chair. They mumbled a few words to each other. One of the men waved to the gallery window. A gurney was immediately rolled into the room by two attendants. These men lifted Errol's limp body onto the gurney, strapped her down across the chest and arms, and rolled it out of the room. I was immediately escorted out of the interview room by the MPs and taken directly to my quarters, where I was locked in my room with the MPs remaining at guard outside the door. After about half an hour, there was a knock at the door of my quarters. When I opened it, General Twining entered, together with the machine operator in the white lab coat. The general introduced the man to me as Dr. Wilcox. He asked me to accompany him and the doctor. We left the room, followed by the MPs. After several twists and turns through the complex, we entered a small room where Errol had been wheeled on the gurney. The general told me that Errol and the Domain were considered to be a very important military threat to the United States. Errol had been immobilized so that she could not depart and return to her base, as she said she would do in the interview. It would be a very grave risk to national security to allow Errol to report what she observed during her time at the base, so it had been determined that decisive action was needed to prevent this. The general asked me if I understood why this was necessary. I said that I did, although I most certainly did not agree that it was the least bit necessary, and I certainly did not agree with the surprise attack on Errol and me in the interview room. However, I said nothing about this to the general because I was very afraid of what might happen to me and Errol if I protested. Dr. Wilcox asked me to approach the gurney and stand next to Errol. Errol lay perfectly still and unmoving on the bed. I could not tell whether she was alive or dead. Several other men in white lab coats, who I assumed were also doctors, stood on the opposite side of the bed. They had connected two pieces of monitoring equipment to Errol's head, arms, and chest. One of these devices I recognized from my training as a surgical nurse as an EEG machine, which is used to detect electrical activity in the brain. The other device was a normal hospital room vital signs monitor, which I knew would be useless since Errol did not have a biological body. Dr. Wilcox explained to me that he had administered a series of mild electro shocks to Earl in an attempt to subdue her long enough to allow military authorities time to evaluate the situation and determine what to do with Earl. He asked me to attempt to communicate with Earl telepathically. I tried for several minutes but couldn't sense any communication from Earl. I couldn't even sense whether Earl was present in the body any longer. I think you must have killed her, I said to the doctor. Dr. Wilcox told me that they would keep Errol under observation and I would be asked to return later to establish communication with Errol again. Roswell, Alien Interview, Chapter 15 my interrogation. Matilda O'Donnell McElroy, personal note. The next morning I was escorted from my quarters under guard of four MPs to the interview room. Errol's overstuffed chair had been removed from the room and replaced by a small desk and several office chairs. I was asked to sit down and wait to be interviewed. After a few minutes, Dr. Wilcox came into the office together with another man wearing a plain business suit. The man introduced himself as John Reed. Dr. Wilcox explained to me that Mr. Reed had been flown in from Chicago at the request of my superior officers to conduct a lie detector test on me. My surprise at this statement was so obvious that Dr. Wilcox noticed that I was obviously taken aback and insulted at the insinuation that I had ever lied about anything. 
Nonetheless, Mr. Reed began to set up his polygraph device on the desk next to my chair while Dr. Wilcox continued to explain in a calm voice that the test was being administered for my own protection. Since all the interviews with the alien had been conducted telepathically and that Errol had decided to read and attest that the typed transcripts were accurate, that the truth and accuracy of the statements contained in the transcripts depended entirely upon my personal word alone. There was no other reliable way to test the accuracy of the transcripts without submitting me to a battery of tests and psychological examinations to determine, in the opinion of experts, meaning himself, whether the transcripts should be taken seriously or not. The tone of his voice said very clearly, or dismissed as the delusional ranting of a mere woman. Mr. Reed proceeded to strap a rubber tube around my chest, as well as an ordinary blood pressure cutoff around my upper arm. Then he placed electrodes on the fingers and surfaces of my hands. He explained that he would be very objective during the interview because he had been thoroughly trained in scientific interrogation. This training was supposed to make his interrogation free of human error. Mr. Reed explained to me that in response to the questions, he and Dr. Wilcox were going to ask me that actual physiological changes would be transmitted through a small panel unit. The readings would then be tracked on moving graph paper, which he placed beside the machine on the desk. The parallel graphs on the paper would then be correlated and interpreted by Mr. Reed with the expert assistance of Dr. Wilcox to determine whether or not I was lying. Both Mr. Reed and Dr. Wilcox asked me a series of innocuous questions to begin, which advanced into a more pointed interrogation about my interviews with Errol. Here's what I remember about the questions. What is your name? Matilda O'Donnell, I replied. What is your date of birth? June 12, 1924, I said. What is your age? 23. Where were you born? Los Angeles, California, I said, and so on and so forth. Are you able to communicate by telepathy? No, I have never been able to do this with anyone except Errol, I said. Were any of the statements you made to the stenographer falsified? No, I answered. Have you intentionally or unintentionally imagined or fabricated any of the communication you claim to have had with the alien? No, of course not, I said. Are you intentionally attempting to deceive anyone? No. Are you attempting to obstruct this test? No. What color are your eyes? Blue. Are you Catholic? Yes. Would you tell the same stories to your parish priest in a Catholic church confessional that you told the stenographer here at the base? Yes. Are you trying to hide anything from us? No, nothing. Do you believe everything the alien communicated to you? Yes. Do you consider yourself to be a gullible person? No. The questions continued in this manner for more than an hour. Finally, I was unhooked from the polygraph machine and allowed to return to my quarters, still under guard by the MPs. Later in the afternoon, I returned to the interview room. This time, the desk was replaced by a hospital gurney. Dr. Wilcox was accompanied by a staff nurse this time. He asked me to lie down on the gurney. He said that he had been requested to ask me the same series of questions that I answered for the lie detector test. This time, however, I would respond to the questions under the influence of a truth serum known as sodium pentothal. As a trained surgical nurse, I was familiar with this barbiturate drug as it was sometimes used as an anesthetic. Dr. Wilcox asked me if I had any objection to submitting to such a test. I told him I had nothing to hide. I cannot recall anything about this interview. I assume that when I finished answering the questions, I was escorted back to my room by the MPs with their assistance this time as I was too wobbly and woozy from the drug to navigate by myself. However, I had a very peaceful sleep that night. Apparently, neither of these interrogations yielded any suspicious results as I was not asked any more questions after that. Thankfully, I was left alone during the rest of my time at the base. Roswell, 
Alien Interview, Chapter 16, Errol Departs, Matilda O'Donnell McElroy, Personal Note. I remained at the base mostly confined to my quarters for another three weeks after Errol had been incapacitated by Dr. Wilcox. Once a day, I was escorted to the room where Errol lay on the bed under continued surveillance by Dr. Wilcox and others. Each time I went to the room, I was asked to try to communicate with Errol again. Each time there was no response. This saddened me a great deal. As the days continued, I became increasingly more certain and distressed that Errol was dead, if that is the right word for it. Every day I reread the transcripts of my interviews with Errol, searching for a clue that might remind me of something or help me in some way to re-establish communication with Errol. I still had the envelope in my possession with copies of the transcripts that Errol was asked to sign. To this day, I don't understand why no one ever asked me to return them. I suppose they forgot about the copy of the transcripts and all the excitement. I did not offer to return them. I kept them concealed under the mattress of my bed all the time I remained at the base, and have kept them with me ever since then. You will be the first person to see these transcripts. Since Errol's body was not biological, the doctors could not detect whether the body was alive or dead unless it moved. Of course, I knew that if Errol was not consciously animating the body as an Isby, the body would not move. I explained this to Dr. Wilcox. I explained this to him several times. Each time he just gave me a patronizing sort of smile, patted my arm, and thanked me for trying again. At the end of the third week, I was told by Dr. Wilcox that my services would no longer be needed because it had been decided by the military to move Arl to a larger, more secure military medical facility that was better equipped to deal with the situation. He didn't say anything about where the facility was located. That was the last time I saw Errol's doll body. The following day, I received written orders signed by General Twining. The orders said that I had completed my service to the U.S. military and was officially discharged from further duty, and that I would receive an honorable discharge and a generous military pension. I would be also relocated by the military and given a new identity with the appropriate documents. Along with the orders, I received a document that I was instructed to read and sign. It was an oath of secrecy. The language of the document was full of legalese, but the point was very clearly made that I was to never, ever discuss anything whatsoever with anyone about anything whatsoever that I had seen, heard, or experienced during my service in the military under pain of death as an act of treason against the United States of America. As it turned out, I was placed into a federal government witness protection program, except that I would be protected from the government by the government. In other words, as long as I stayed quiet, I could stay alive. The following morning, I was placed aboard a small military transport plane and flown to a relocation destination. After being shuttled to several locations for short periods, I eventually ended up in Glasgow, Montana, near Fort Peck. The night before I was scheduled to board the transport plane, I lay in bed contemplating the whole affair and wondering what happened to Errol and to me. I suddenly heard Errol's voice. I sat bolt upright in my bed and turned on the light on the nightstand. I looked around the room frantically for a few seconds. Then I realized that it was Errol, the Isby. Her body was not in the room with me, of course, and it didn't need to be. She said, hello. The tone of her thought was plain and friendly. It was unmistakably Errol. I did not have the least doubt about that. I thought, Errol, are you still here? She answered that she was here but not in the body on earth. She had returned to her post at the domain base when the doctor and the MPs attacked us in the interview room. She was pleased to perceive that I was well and that I was going to be released unharmed. I wondered how she escaped from them. I was worried that they might have injured Errol by the shock machine. Errol said that she was able to leave the body before the shock was administered and avoid the electric current running through the body. She wanted to let me know that she was safe and not to worry about her. I was very relieved, to say the least. I asked Errol if I would ever see her again. Errol reassured me that we are both Isbees. We are not physical bodies. Now that she had located me in space and time, we would always stay in communication. Errol wished me well, and my communication with her ended for the moment.
Roswell, Alien Interview, Postscript from Mrs. McElroy. Editor's Note. The following message was enclosed in a separate envelope marked Read Me Last, together with the original letter, the transcripts, and the other notes of explanation I received in the envelope from Mrs. McElroy. This is what the message said. The other documents in this envelope are the end of the story as far as what happened back in 1947. However, several months after the government got me settled at my final relocation destination, I continued my communication with Errol on a regular basis. It has been almost exactly 40 years since the crash at Roswell. Since then, it has become obvious to me that I have been able to communicate telepathically with Errol for one reason. I am one of the 3,000 members of the Lost Battalion. At this time, all the members of the Lost Battalion have been located on Earth as a result of the Domain Anunnaki mission and their use of the Tree of Life detection device. Through my communication with Errol, I have recovered some of my memory of lives I've spent on Earth over the past 8,000 years. Most of these memories are not especially important compared to the long backtrack of events, but it has been a necessary stepping stone to regaining my awareness and ability as an ISBE. I can also remember some dim patches of my life in the Domain Expeditionary Force. I was a nurse there, too. For the most part, I've been a nurse over and over and over again, down through the ages. I stick with being a nurse because it's familiar to me, and I enjoy the work of helping people, as well as the members of the race of biological beings in the Domain whose bodies look more like insects than mammals, especially their hands. Even doll bodies need some repair once in a while, too. As I remember more about my past, I realize that the rest of my life is in the future. Eternity is not just in the past. Eternity is in the future. At this point, I'm still not able to fully return to the domain. I am sentenced to eternal imprisonment, like all other Isbees, in the living hell called Earth, until we can disable the old Empire force screens. Because I won't keep my biological body much longer now, I am intensely aware that very soon I will be recycled through the amnesia process of the old empire and stuck back into another baby body to start all over again without any memory of what went before. As you know, members of the Domain Expeditionary Force have been working to solve this problem for thousands of years. Errol said that even though the Domain has located all of the Lost Battalion officers and crew, the success of freeing them depends on the Isbees who are already on Earth. The Domain Central Command cannot authorize any personnel or resources at this time to conduct a rescue mission, as this is not the primary mission of the Domain Expeditionary Force in this galaxy. So if Isbees on Earth are going to escape from this prison, it will have to be an inside job, so to speak. The inmates will have to figure out how to get themselves out. Various methods of recovering the memory and ability of the Isbees have been developed over the past 10,000 years on Earth, but none have proven to be consistently effective so far. Errol mentioned that the most significant breakthrough was made by Gautama Siddhartha about 2,500 years ago. However, the original teachings and techniques taught by the Buddha have been altered or lost over the millennia since then. The practical techniques of this philosophy were perverted into robotic religious rituals by priests as a self-serving instrument of control or slavery. However, another major advance occurred recently. An acquaintance of the commanding officer of the Domain Expeditionary Force Space Station is an ISBE who had once been an important engineer and officer in the old Empire Space Fleet. He became an untouchable himself about 10,000 years ago and was sentenced to Earth for leading a mutiny against the oppressive regime of the old empire. The engineer was trained in advanced scientific improvisation theory thousands of years ago. This man has applied his expertise to helping the domain solve the apparently unsolvable problem of rescuing the members of the Lost Battalion as well as the Isbees on Earth. Careful observation and experimental analysis of the mechanics of memory in Isbees by he and his wife, who assisted him, led to the realization that Isbees can recover from amnesia and also regain lost abilities. Together, they discovered and developed effective methods that they used to rehabilitate their own memories. 
They eventually codified their methods so that others can safely be trained to apply them to themselves and others without detection by the old empire thought control operators. Their research also revealed that ISBs can occupy and operate more than one body at the same time, a fact that previously was thought to be uniquely limited to officers of the domain. One example of this fact is that the engineer in a previous lifetime on Earth was Suleiman the Magnificent. His assistant was a harem girl who rose up from slavery to become his wife and rule the Ottoman Empire with him. Simultaneously, she inhabited another body and ruled her own empire as Queen Elizabeth. As the Queen of England, she never married because she was already married to the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. In a later life, he was incarnated as Cecil Rhodes. During his life as Rhodes, she was again a princess, this time from Poland. As such, she pursued Rhodes unsuccessfully toward the end of his life. However, in their next incarnation, they met again, were married, had a family, and again worked together successfully all of their lives. Several other notable examples of this phenomena were observed. For example, the process of refining steel was invented by the same Isby who inhabited two bodies simultaneously. One was named Kelly, who lived in Kentucky, and the other was a man named Bessemer, who lived in England. They both conceived the same process at the same time. Another example is Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, which was invented by several others at the same time, including Elijah Gray. The telephone was conceived concurrently in several locations around the world all at once. This was a single ISBI of such tremendous energy and ability that he was able to operate several bodies in several different locations while conducting complex research work. Thanks to these revelations, the domain has been able to return some of ISBIs of the Lost Battalion to active duty on a limited part-time basis. For example, two young girls who occupy biological bodies on Earth now are at the same time working as active members of the Domain Expeditionary Force on the asteroid space station as operators of a communication switchboard. These operators relay messages between the Domain Expeditionary Force and the Domain Command Headquarters. Recently, I myself have been able to resume some of my own duties for the Domain Expeditionary Force while continuing to live on Earth. This is not an easy task, however, and can only be done while my biological body is sleeping. It makes me very, very happy to know that we may not have to stay on Earth forever. There is hope of escape not just for the Lost Battalion, but for many other Isbies on Earth. However, all Isbies could be helped to become more aware of the actual situation on Earth through the information in this envelope. This is why I sent these letters and transcripts to you I want you to get these documents published. I want ISBs on Earth to have a chance to find out what is really happening on Earth. Most ISBs will not believe any of it, I'm sure. It seems too incredible. No reasonable person would ever believe a word of it. However, it only seems incredible to an ISB whose memory has been erased and replaced with false information inside the electronically controlled illusion of a prison planet. We must not allow the apparent incredibility of our situation to prevent us from confronting the reality of it. Frankly, reasons have nothing to do with reality. There are no reasons. Things are what they are. If we don't face the facts of our situation, we're going to stay under the thumb of the old empire forever. The biggest weapon the old empire has left now is our ignorance of what they were doing to all the Isbies on earth. Disbelief and secrecy are the most effective weapons they have. The government agencies that classify the enclosed transcripts as top secret are run by ISBs who are nothing more than mindless automations covertly ordered through the hypnotic commands given by the old empire prison operators. They are the unknowing slaves of unseen slave masters and all the more enslaved by their willingness to be slaves. Most of the Isbies on Earth are good, honest, able beings, artists, managers, geniuses, free thinkers, and revolutionaries who have harmed no one, really. They are no threat to anyone except the criminals who have imprisoned them. They must find out about the old empire amnesia and hypnosis operation. They must remember their own past lives. The only way this will ever happen is to communicate, coordinate, and fight back. 
We have to tell other people, and they have to discuss it openly with each other. Communication is the only effective weapon against secrecy and oppression. This is why I'm asking you to tell this story. Please share these transcripts with as many people as you can. If the people of Earth are told what is really going on here, perhaps they will begin to remember who they are and where they came from. For now we can begin our own release and rescue with words. We can be free again. We can be ourselves again. Perhaps I will meet you in person, with or without a body, somewhere in our eternal future. Good luck to all of us. Matilda O'Donnell McElroy End of Mrs. McElroy Documents